Say, come out and vote. And by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Cool TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Jake Berry, Conservative MP and former Conservative Party Chairman, and you're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, escalation in the Middle East. US officials have told American media that Israel's missiles have struck Iran earlier this morning. Iranian authorities say they intercepted at least three drones. The Israeli military has refused to comment. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called for an end to sick note culture in Britain in a major speech on welfare reform. And Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch says she wants to get rid of equality quotas for large businesses. She claims they damage economic growth. Is she right? You can give me a call on 0344 499 1000 text on 87222 or tweet us on x at talk tv but first let's get the news headlines with miranda shuka good morning the government is stressing the need for de-escalation and moderation as iran has struck by an apparent drone strike tehran says it had to use air defense systems overnight with U.S. sources claiming Israel was behind the attack. Iranian state media says there's been no reported damage and the nuclear facilities have not been hit. Former Israeli MP Ksenia Svetlova told us Iran's threat to hit back at Iran's nuclear facilities if its own are hit is a worrying development. This is what I call a serious escalation. This is something that the world should focus on right now uh, and use the time that we have. We don't know how much we have right now because we know that Iran is just a couple of months away, you know, from the bomb uh, in order to stop this. The Prime Minister is expected to call for an end to the UK's sick note culture in a major speech on welfare reform. Rishi Sunak will say the focus must shift to what people might be able to do after concerns that some are being unnecessarily written off as sick. But Talk TV's political correspondent told us the details aren't yet clear. Lots of NHS kind of measures that Rishi Sunak is putting in place is it all kind of stems to the fact that we just don't have enough GPs at the moment. So adding pressure to, onto them at the moment with sick notes mm -hmm. and asking that, that of them, I think Rishi Sunak is probably trying to kill two birds with one stone, take some of the pressure away from the NHS GPs and give to these specialists. However, we don't really know a whole lot about who these specialists will be. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Peter Murrell was taken into custody yesterday and was questioned by police Scotland detectives. He was previously arrested as a suspect in April last year before being released without charge. Now, children as young as five are spending time often unsupervised on social media. Regulator Ofcom says 38% of kids now use platforms including TikTok, WhatsApp and Instagram. Nearly a quarter of UK five to seven year olds now have their own smartphone. And statues honouring the servicemen who died on D-Day have been installed in Normandy. 1,475 silhouettes of soldiers make up the Standing with Giants for Your Tomorrow installation at the British Normandy Memor Memorial in Vers-sur-Mer as part of the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And you're up to date with the headlines now for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello, it's turning increasingly cloudy, wet and windy from the north for this afternoon after a sunny start virtually everywhere. So we see that cloud and rain and the brisk wind spreading across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England and the north of Wales and parts of the Midlands through this afternoon. The far north of Scotland becoming dry and brighter before the day is out. But the best of the sunshine and the dry weather along southern counties of England where with light winds it will be feeling mild in the sunshine but feeling cool under the cloud, rain and brisk winds elsewhere. Overnight that front continues its journey further southwards across remaining parts of England and Wales so for central and southern parts of the UK it will be a cloudy and damp night further north it will be clear now with the brisk winds overnight it shouldn't be too cold and it should be mostly frost free although a patchy frost is likely in some rural spots of Scotland where showers will continue there then for tomorrow we'll see that cloud and rain clear from central and southern areas early in the morning then lots of sunshine will be developing it still remains windy though across eastern parts of the UK but further west I think we will see the winds eventually ease and we'll see dry conditions shower are likely though for many central and eastern parts of the UK, still some of them rather heavy and still quite cool along the east coast. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning, welcome back. I'm Jake Berry and you're with Talk TV and today we've got a real Corker of a question for you after yet more headlines claiming that bad behaviour of MPs has derailed Parliament. We want to know from you, how would you clear up politics? What do we need to do to make these MPs behave themselves? Give me a call. Text on 87222 or tweet us on X at Talk TV. And never forget that on Fridays here on Talk TV, on The Jake Berry Show, it is the joy of text. So keep those texts coming in. You may have the opportunity to shine. I am so interested to hear from you or see what you send in today. What do we need to do to stop these MPs allegedly getting dogs drunk? Tell me. Get in touch. Joining me now to run through all of the top stories are his former Labour advisors, Stella Chandakidu and Matthew Lazo. Welcome Good to morning. the show, guys. Thank you we very much. We need a collective noun for former Labour advisors. <laughs> I don't exactly. Don't I, 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 don't know, I, I don't know. <laughs> the coven of former Labour advisors. Anyway, look, let's start. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to hold back a bit. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fizzing with glee about our, <laughs> our viewers getting in touch, telling me how badly behaved MPs are and what we can do about it. I think um, horse whip them through the streets of Westminster. That's what I say. Some of them might enjoy that, though. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Only the Tories there. Yeah, oh, Only you the you Tories. Said it. No, well, I can say it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. One of them. I'm one of them. Um, right, but before, more seriously, bit of a developing situation overnight. Now, I want to remember last Saturday that Iran uh, sent dozens of missiles uh, towards Israel. There's actually a very interesting coalition, including Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the United Kingdom, the United States of America were involved in shooting down all but three, I think, of those missiles. Big pressure then from President Biden on Netanyahu to say, look, you know, you won, take the win, is what he said. Don't retaliate. But Matthew, we're learning overnight that this isn't advice that Netanyahu and the IDF, Israeli Defence Forces, have taken, is it? Well, it's not advice they've taken completely, but I think there'll be actually a, a sense of relief this morning uh, that this wasn't a more full-scale attack. It looks like uh, the Israelis have been targeting uh, what they believe are nuclear facilities uh, inside Iraq. Uh, it looks like some of the um, uh, the drones used actually came... Uh, uh, sorry, within Iran. Uh, came actually from Kurdish territory rather than from uh, Israeli territory itself. Um, and the uh, Iranians have been saying this morning that it's uh, business as usual, uh, that nothing's been affected, and they're insisting that no nuclear <clears throat> sites have been taken out. So I think it looked like politically, although the, by et al, the whole of the Western coalition said, restraint, 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 take, you, take the win, it looks like they have just about taken the win by doing enough for Israeli public opinion, but without ratcheting it up well, look, with attacks on civilians. We're, we're going to have to wait and see, aren't we? Because, yeah. um, you know, I mean, the Iranians were denying anything had even happened this yeah. morning, which is why I'm so pleased to be joined now by senior former senior military intelligence officer, Philip Cleveland. We love getting the experts here on Talk TV to keep you informed about what is going on. Philip, what can you tell us uh, is your understanding about what has actually occurred uh, overnight? Morning, Jake. Well, um, you know, what's occurred overnight? Uh, Iranian airspace was closed for a period of time. There are reports of explosions um, in uh, around an Iranian airfield near a nuclear 
facility. Um, there have been reports of Iranian air defence systems being activated, and unnamed spokesmen have told CBS News in the United States, unnamed US spokesman, uh, that Israel had uh, pre-warned the United States that they were going to attack Iran. Um, the rest of it that we're getting at the moment is speculation. Uh, there's a lot of people are analysing information that doesn't really exist at the moment, and that is turning um, round into world leaders making statements about whether Israel is being constrained, what Iranian um, reaction is going to be. The bottom line is we don't know what the reality is, um, and we're in a dangerous moment at the uh, period at the moment. Something has happened. It's probable that it's um, Israel responding to last weekend's um, attack, and that would be Israel putting one foot up the next um, ladder of escalation on the rung of ladder of escalation, uh, whether they bring their second foot up and whether that causes Iran to respond, we'll only know as more information comes out. Uh, would you accept a point made by one of our brilliant panellists, Matthew Lazar, just before, I don't know if you heard it, just before you came on our screens, that this does seem like a, a fairly low-level response rather than uh, a sort of all-out escalation. Would, would that be... Uh, correct analysis and is that is that maybe because of the pressure brought on Israel by the United States? Yeah, from from, from what we know uh, or what we're speculating at the moment, yes, it would seem to be that, um, and there there is pressure. You, Netanyahu is in a difficult position. He's got an extreme right wing element to his government. Uh, it's the first time Iran has directly attacked Israel, and therefore he has to respond. Can you imagine what would be going on in the UK if? we'd been directly attacked by someone and then decided not to respond because the United States had said, um, you know, it not, not, nothing was too badly damaged, please leave it alone. Um, so he has to respond. Um, and if this is that response, it does seem to be very measured. But you know, Iran is unpredictable. They seem to be playing everything down in the, in the press at the moment, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, we'll only know as more detail comes out through the day. Um, um, Philip, um... I think quite interesting, we saw in relation to the attack last Saturday that some unusual actors came to the aid of Israel. Yep. I don't think anyone would be surprised that the United Kingdom and the United States uh, supported one of their closest allies. Uh, what does it say about the wider region uh, that you know both Saudi Arabia and Jordan became involved? I, I mean, I suppose ultimately their own territorial airspace was breached by this attack as well. That may be why they became involved. But um, what, what does it say about wider sort of regional support for Israel that those two countries specifically came to Israel's aid? Well, you know, the, the, the history of all of this goes back to, you know, um, a, a Sunni Shia civil war that's been going on, going on between, uh, uh, fought, fought out by proxies between Saudi Arabia and Iran for, for centuries, you know, even before they were called the names that they're called now. Um, and therefore, I'm not surprised that Saudi getting involved. Jordan is is a, is a little bit more uh, is a little bit more interesting, and Iraq was apparently involved as well. But I think it sends a very clear message that the countries across the Middle East are behind what the West is doing in its support for Israel. So Israel isn't completely isolated here, and that's sending a very powerful message to Iran. Um, and therefore, I think it's a very important message that was sent to Iran, which is why Iran does not want to escalate this because it could turn into a full. Um, regional conflict really quite easily and we're already seeing the different sides lining up and Iran is pretty isolated. And it, we know about Iran certainly that in terms of this wider conflict with Israel that their sort of their history, their sort of modus operandi is to fight Israel or through proxies. Do you think we'll see an escalation of violence in, in other areas maybe like the Lebanon as a direct response to this rather than Iran striking back? Um, I, I don't think those different proxies need an excuse to escalate what they're doing, and therefore they'll take what's happened here, um, and we will probably see an escalation. You know, Iran is fighting its war with Israel, and, and therefore uh, uh, with um, the, the, the wider region through proxies. And those proxies, it's it's stated within their their founding charters that you know they um, don't um, agree with uh, Israel's legal status to exist. And they therefore want to destroy it as a state and and, and to kill all Jews uh, and that and uh, then create a caliphate with Tehran uh, with the Grand Ayatollah um, in Iran at the centre of that caliphate. That is their stated aim. 
Iran doesn't want to do that directly, but it's more than happy to stimulate that and, and keep it going through its proxies. It's not good for um, a negotiation stance when we're looking at what's going on inside Gaza, um, and it's not good for regional peace. Uh, Philip, well, f finally, you sort of uh, think you sort of uh, precursed my final question is, of course, we're all talking about the, the escalation of the conflict between Iran and Israel, quite correctly. It's something we should all be concerned about. But we seem to have stopped talking about the ongoing conflict in Gaza. What is happening in Gaza? Are we seeing those humanitarian convoys? We know in response to pressure from America, the Israeli government opened up significant new humanitarian corridors. Are we seeing an increase in the amount of humanitarian aid getting into Gaza? And, and is Israel still prosecuting this war with the ferocity that it previously has done against Hamas? Well, Israel has been reducing the ferocity of its um, attacks against Hamas um, over the over the coming weeks and, and, and months, partially because of international pressure, partially because they've had some success militarily, uh, and partially because there isn't a military solution to this. So there is more humanitarian aid getting in. Um, there, are, there, there seems to be less attacks causing civilian casualties, and that's why we're not getting it uh, 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 pushed in, into the news. It seems to be that the focus is now on Iran. But Gaza, there's no um, short-term or long-term solution to this. And even a humanitarian pause or a ceasefire without there being some form of longer-term solution is, is not going to bring stability into the region. And we're starting to see some countries trying to formally recognize um, Palestine in the United Nations. Now, they're already represented in the United Nations, but we're seeing an upping of the international political ante and all of this trying to force Israel's hand into looking at this longer term solution. Without that, everything else is just applying a sticking plaster on top of thousands of sticking plasters that have been applied over the years anyway. Philip, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk TV. We really thank do you. appreciate hearing your expert voice into what is a very, very complicated uh, conflict that we are seeing develop there. Stella, um, let's deal first, we will come on to Gaza, but let's deal first with Iran. Um, do you think that American pressure in terms of trying to persuade Netanyahu and the Israeli government is paying dividends here? And this has been a more muted response than we otherwise would have seen. So I have two questions when I hear, uh, when I, when I heard Philip talking about this. One, if all the actors which are involved, uh, Iran, the US, its European allies, they all want the situation to de-escalate. Nobody wants an all-out war, including all the countries in the Middle East that, that, that we just mentioned. Who is it that is going to escalate this war? It seems to me that the, the, the arrow is pointing to one direction, and the only person who we are scared of, of taking the wrong decision, of making the wrong step, is Netanyahu, which brings us back to him just being a completely, the completely the wrong leader for this point. Well, look, we, look, we can't do anything about who the, you know, Israel is a democracy, their, their prime minister is their prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of this de-escalation, we're seeing a reduction in harm, I hope, Philip's yes. clear about that, in Gaza, which everyone should be very thankful for because of the appalling humanitarian situation. But it does seem that Israel haven't gone for a full-throated response to a significant escalation by Iran, and surely that's something that should give us all hope. Yes, but isn't it interesting that we are living, we are living in a world where everyone has access to uh, international news everywhere, everyone is speaking English, and we are, it feels to me like we are in this PR kind of world where, where we are trying, we are hoping that the impression of one voter base from the media that they are receiving mm. wherever they are in the world is going to be one where the leaders who are being voted by these people will feel like, okay, we have done enough. We do not need to look like we are making a stronger move or something like that. And I think that this is a very, very dangerous way to make foreign policy because we live in a world where you cannot depend on international media to play along with whatever we think is best for international security. It's just not going to happen. If there are some news stories in the next few days that make Israel look weak in the eyes of Israeli voters, or I I Iran as well look weak in the eyes of its mm. allies and the people that they are trying to satisfy, impress, um, keep in check, 
then does that mean that we are going to be in danger of this war turn, taking an ugly, an ugly turn? And yeah. also, what does that mean for uh, uh, countries in Europe and, in, and the US when you have a pre-election period where, the go where, where voters in these countries were also looking at the government for guidance yeah. and for security? Look, very, very good point. Let me bring Matthew in just finally on this. Look, um, let me put a sort of counter-argument mm -hmm. to you, if I may. So let's say the English Foreign Secretary, or British Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, was visiting, a, I don't know, a, a consul general in, in Jordan, and Israel launched an attack at it, or a, a foreign power launched an attack at it, and blew up our consul general, basically British soil, diplomatic soil, and our Foreign Secretary was killed. People would be demanding a response to the UK. Now, people who support Iran, I'm certainly not one of them, but people who support Iran say, actually, their attack on Israel was a legitimate response to an attack on Iranian sovereign territory. Surely that's why, whether you accept that argument or not, and as I say, I'm not an Iranian, Iranian supporter, surely Israel responding again following that um, Iranian attempt to bomb Israel on the 13th of this month is retaliation, is escalating this again. What can we do to try and make sure that Israel do not continue down this road? Well, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it is the unanswerable question, really. I mean, the, is, the Israeli attack, which, of course, they don't claim uh, responsibility for, but we all, everybody knows that it, it was them uh, on the diplomatic compound, broke the number one rule of international relations, the, uh, the rules of diplomacy, that you don't attack uh, diplomatic missions. So, I mean, that is the... It can be thrown back again and again. Uh, it, the problem, I think, is, is that because the Iranian attack was basically so broad brush uh, on Israel... Uh, uh, that that's why Israel had to respond. I think if it had been targeted, you might have seen the, uh, the, the US managed to get uh, Israel to respond, uh, you know, at a very low level or even or even less. But let's hope that, this, they, that is this, is, this is the end. I think it could have been a lot worse. Uh, but as you say, logically, um, what, what you say is right. And that's going to continue to be put by voters, of course, uh, who are anxious about the situation to governments across the West, including our own. Yeah. Quite well, Rishi Sunak's been out and about today giving a uh, high-level speech on his about his views on what is colloquially known as sick note Britain. And my friends watching and listening at home, I just put this to you, that the number of people claiming sickness benefit has gone up by two thirds since the end of COVID. Now this has led our prime minister on our uh, health and work and pension secretary, Mel Stride, to say, what on earth can we do about it? Well, they've come up with a brand new big idea, which I actually think is an old idea. I seem to remember us doing something like this in 2010, that your local GP will no longer be able to sign you off sick. You will have to go to a centre, I think they're called a well-to-work centre or something nonsense like that, uh, where you will be assessed and they will try and work out what you can actually do. Stella, big intervention from the Prime Minister. Will it work? No. So, okay. two points. Firstly, Firstly, the people, that, the people who usually go to get a sick note are people who are already at work. So the whole rhetoric has been connected to people who are on disability benefits and people who don't want to work. Well, uh, sorry, let me just pick you up. I, I'm not sure you're just quite right about that. So I, I was looking at the story this morning. I, I think from memory the figures are something like 75% of people who go to the doctor to get a quote-unquote sick note. There is a box the doctor can tick which says this person is not fit for any form of work whatsoever. And then they go off work into sickness benefits. And that, I believe, in, in the speech, is one of the things Prime Minister set out to change. This would be, this would be two different cohorts of people. They would be at uh, different standards because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain that the same standards that a doctor will have to check are not the same as, you know, a tribunal just and a, a social security tribunal would have to check for you to, like, appeal a decision on your disability benefits. It's not going to be the same standards. The second thing I would say is, again, we are using rhetoric to target a weak group of people that probably applies to a very tiny minority of people and probably not the, the, the same ones who, who, who need this kind of policy. Usually the people... What, what Rishi Shunak is suggesting is that a lot of these people who have a sick note are not really sick. They are well enough to work and, you know, maybe they, they are a little bit sick but not really that sick that they couldn't work at all. But the kind of person who can get their doctor to give them either a fake or an exaggerated sick well, yeah, note yeah, yeah. is not the kind of person. It's the kind of person who, who is, has confidence, who has the means to support that kind of decision. It's not the kind of person who is 
probably going to be damaged by this kind of rhetoric. Because what he's basically doing is he's saying, hey, managers everywhere in workplaces, I am giving you the moral right to punish uh, so, so, your well, employees. Well, well, hold, hold on, hold on. So, you know, there are three million people currently on out of work sickness benefit. That's gone up by nearly a million people since COVID. And a lot of them, I don't know the exact figure, are mental health. Well, what the Prime Minister is saying are, are, have been signed off for mental health issues, which can be absolutely debilitating. I'm not belittling it in any way whatsoever. So what the Prime Minister is saying is, you know, first of all, working has been proven, is proven to be one of the better ways to improve your mental health. It's about self-esteem, it's about defining who you are, it's about going to work. So he's saying that we're doing people a disservice by signing them off and saying you can't go to work because it actually compounds a lot of the issues they have. And the second but point, not... the second point is that if you're just signed off sick by a GP, the Prime Minister has said in this speech, you know, you just almost written off. What he wants to do is have it done in centres where they say, well, if you can't continue your work as whatever it may be, a carer, say, there are other jobs you could do even with this level of sickness. What that, he wants and it's to about, do is he wants to blanket punish, he wants to blanket punish sick so people so. without actually putting in place any measure that's going to help the people who have been written off sick. So, Matthew, are we Whether blanket, are we blanket punishing people? No, I mean, I think some of the rhetoric... Uh, 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 could be could do with finessing so that it doesn't appear that it's targeting those who are quite legitimately uh, on sick benefits, uh, on disability, disability benefits. I think that the, the issue here is that ESG is writing people off. I mean, we all remember in the uh, 80s, uh, particularly in former industrial areas, there was a kind of culture of people who you know, left the shipyard or left the coal mine, um, um, uh, had an industrial disease, and obviously weren't going to go back into hard manual labour, were basically given a sick note by GPs because they felt, you know, a sector felt sorry okay. for them. I think that's... All right, OK, Matthew, we're going to have to go to break. Uh, look, this is Talk TV coming up. We're going to be talking about Rishi Sunak and Sick Note Britain again. Don't you worry, you can hear more from Matthew on that straight after this break. I'm Jake Berry and you're watching Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back, I'm Jake Berry and you're with Talk TV. Now, I want to hear from you today because we have found out that another scandal has broken in Parliament and a Conservative MP, Mark Menzies, the Member of Parliament for File, has lost the whip and he is in good company. There are now 18 Members of Parliament, the whipless wonders. They would be the third biggest political party in Westminster who have lost their whip for some form of bad behaviour and that's why we want to hear from you because if we're going to clamp down on MPs' bad behaviour, you might all think we should, how do we do it? We love coming up with the solutions here on Talk TV. You can give me a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or tweet us on X at Talk TV. We, just before the break, we were having a bit of a chat about how Rishi Sunak is going to clamp down on Sick Note Britain. And joining me to discuss this and all the other matters in the news is Tim Montgomery, former number 10 advisor and founder of Conservative Home. Tim, thank you for coming on the show. Good morning, Jake. Good to see you again. Um, Tim, have you had the opportunity to have a look at the speech that Rishi Sunak has just given? And is he right? Is, do we need to clamp down on the additional one million people who have been signed off for sickness since COVID? Well, I haven't seen the full speech yet, Jake, but I've seen some of the extracts and um, I've heard some of the morning rounds of interviews that Mel Stride, the Worker Pension Secretary, has done. And I think this is a genuine problem that really does need to be tackled. There is, and I think particularly since the pandemic, there has been a rise in mental health problems. I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that a lot of people have got real life struggles at the moment and we need to help them. But the country simply cannot afford to have quite so many people applying for sickness benefits and living at the expense of people, taxpayers, who are often already struggling. We all know the cost of living pressures. And so I think this is an effort to achieve more fairness. Fairness for those people who need help with their mental health, but fairness also for taxpayers who are already paying the highest tax burden since the Second World War. But, Tim, only six months out from a likely date of a general election in early October, governments only do things in this sort of time in the parliamentary lifespan that seem to... they think are more likely to be popular with the public. Is this electorally smart of Rishi Sunak and his team? Is this something that's going to encourage people to vote Conservative? Is this thing our, our voters, Conservative voters, care about? Well, look, Jake, if Jesus Christ returned today and for some theologically um, debatable reason became leader of the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party would still lose the next general election. I think our party is doomed. Um, but so if, if we're looking for, to judge this policy on whether it's going to transform Tory fortunes, then it would definitely be a no from me. But is it the right kind of thing a Conservative government should be doing? Trying to be a good steward of taxpayers' money, of stopping abuse of the welfare state, while helping people in genuine need, it's definitely the right sort of policy. But electorally, I don't think it will make any difference at all because I think people have stopped listening to Rishi Sunak, have stopped listening to Conservative ministers. Um, they want a change in government, but that doesn't mean that this isn't good housekeeping from a government in its last few months. OK, well, um, you know, it's good for the Conservative Party to occasionally try and do Conservative things. That's normally the sort of thing I would support. <laughs> On the issue of good housekeeping, um, we hear that the government has dropped its pledge to get flights off to Rwanda by the spring, now pushing it into late summer, of course, saying that it's the Labour Party's fault and Labour peers in the House of Lords who are blocking it. Um, do you think, again, the electorate even care about this or is this Rwanda policy something the electorate has stopped listening to? Well, I did a completely unscientific poll amongst people who follow me on Twitter, on X, the other day, 
Um, nearly 4,000 people voted, and only 4% of those people thought that the Rwanda policy would make a difference. And I would be one of those people who, um, you know, 96% who don't think it will make a substantial difference. And I don't have a, an ethical objection to the policy, Jake. I think it's perfectly reasonable to deport people who enter our country illegally to get them to Rwanda or wherever. But in terms of actually a policy that will make a difference, the government has put so many eggs in this basket and I just don't think it will make much of a difference, partly because the government in Rwanda aren't willing to take the scale of people that would be necessary to establish this policy as a proper deterrent. I but think Tim, the government doesn't it, doesn't would be it speak much better... To, doesn't it speak to trust, Sorry. though? Doesn't it speak to trust? Because we were told by the Prime Minister that he would stop the boats, they are still coming. We were told by the Prime Minister that flights would leave to for Rwanda in the spring. That hasn't happened. So whether people think it will work or not, isn't there just a bit of an expectation that the government does what it says it's going to do? Yes, but is it really worth having a policy that isn't going to make much of a difference? Um, I think it would be much better if a year or so ago when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, he said this isn't going to make enough of a difference, it's cost too much money and I'm going to shelve it. But Tim, perhaps we're if too we... far... If, if we only voted for policies that actually worked in Parliament, one, we wouldn't end up voting on very much, and two, we definitely wouldn't have voted, <laughs> voted for this absurd smoking ban uh, earlier this week. Look, move, moving on slightly to the Labour Party, um, we learned two things today. First of all, that uh, the Labour Party appeared to have destroyed all documentation, having a sort of shredding party of uh, documents which could have revealed where Angela Rayner lived when she applied to become a Labour MP. In all fairness to the Labour Party, they say they haven't just done it in her case. This is their standard practice. Um, this Angela Rayner story, sort of querying where she may or may not have lived, whether she owed tax or not, she completely denies all wrongdoing whatsoever. It isn't going away, is it, for the Labour Party? It's not going away. But just to make a slightly broader point, if I may, Jake, we, we have the arrest of Nicola Sturgeon's husband in Scotland. We've had the Mark Menzies business, uh, which you just uh, focused on. I think the sad thing for politics at the moment is that all of the political parties are mired in allegations of this kind. And it's very sad. And I, my worry about the effect on voters of seeing all of politics just behaving so dysfunctionally when we could be talking about the big issues that the country faces, the West as a civilization, I think, is in trouble. We're not investing in our defence. There was a talk yesterday about Scotland not meeting its climate change targets. We have an economy that's very sluggish compared to historical performance. And all we're talking about are these scandals. And it's really not good for faith in democracy. No, and it does sort of inform that view, a bit of a plague in all your houses, which may mean that we see a very low turnout at the next general election. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. We're really grateful to hear from you again on Talk TV. You're one of our superstar guests. Look, turning to uh, Matthew and Stella, who are still with me, um, I'll let you come straight back, Stella, on the... I saw you rolling your eyes about <laughs> Angela Rayner. I thought I was quite fair, because I said, you know, they, they, they haven't done a, They haven't destroyed this evidence because it's Angela Rayner. It's just what it's they do. It's just the It's just what they do. It's just better than exactly. made that. So, so they were just complying with their own policy. I'm not suggesting one moment they weren't. And, of course, she denies all allegations. But this isn't really going away, this story, is it? Yes, it's not... It's not getting away, and the reason why it's not going away is because there are all of these story commentators uh, who are literally trying to revive this completely dead story. You have James Daly, a Tory MP, deputy chairman of the Tory party, being like, but police officers, please, I know you're so well-resourced. You have all of this time. We literally haven't had a single rapist who has been successfully prosecuted in the last I don't know how long, and yet you have them looking at a woman who, how many years ago was it like 10 years ago how, how many years ago was yeah, it's about who, 10 years who, 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 who was a single mother before she who, was an mp as well yeah, yeah before she was an mp as well at the same time you have an actually co current to a tory mp i mean the whip has been removed from him who has used campaign funds allegedly to, allegedly has used campaign funds funds to pay off some person that he met on tinder 
who... Uh, uh, I, guess, who I, guess, I, guess it, I guess it may have been Grinder, but Matthew, yes, let, me, gonna... let me bring you in. <laughs> there, there apparently is a difference. I've never been on either, but let me bring you in, Matthew. Look, Andrew Rayner, but I, I appreciate what Stella says, but there are multiple lines of inquiry being pursued yeah. by Greater Manchester Police. Uh, I'm a big fan of Angela Rayner. I, I say every week I have, a, I have a photo, I have a picture of a poster of her up in my office, the great Angela Rayner. Um, but this is... Keir Starmer said yesterday, I was listening to him in Teesside, he was saying, I want to talk about the local elections, the mayoral elections, your police and crime commission elections, but everyone's asking about Angela Rayner. That, how long can this continue? Well, the answer is as long as the Greater Manchester Police investigation uh, uh, goes on, because now it's out of everybody's hands uh, apart from uh, the police's. Because uh, if they decide that they are uh, that they want to bring charges uh, and, go, and a file sent to the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, then that is clearly very difficult for Angela. Or they're going to or they're going to say there's nothing to answer here. And nobody, even James Daly, the Tory MP, uh, and her harshest critics can complain because it looks like they've got 12 or 13 detectives. Uh, on this, so it's being looked at very thoroughly. Well, so I, I think the, the truth of the matter is, I it's now nobody can control it. The, 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 the allegation from James Daly, certainly not in relation to others, is that Greater Manchester Police hadn't properly looked at this. They've gone from I'm one sure, extreme to the I'm other. Sure, I'm sure he will now be relieved that they have thrown the uh, proverbial kitchen sink at this uh, historic investigation. As a Greater Mancunian. <laughs> yeah. You know. A, a lot, whether she's done something right. No, no, she, 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 she denies everything. No, no, absolutely. But you would have thought the police might have something better to do. You, well. you know oh. what, what enrages me? You had this other... You had this other a lot of things, MP Stella. Who, who was... A lot of... <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Uh, you had this other Tory MP who, 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 who was found to have... Um, uh, sorry, what was the last scandal? I've, I've uh, William Rag? Yes, William Rag, who, who was found... Uh, what, what did he William Rag was... Allegedly provided other people's telephone numbers yes. in response to a blackmailer. Yes. On the same app. Yeah. Everyone was so considered and so careful about his mental health and we need to be kind and this is so embarrassing for him and I feel so bad for him. And you have Angela Rayner, who is also a mother, let's not forget, she has kids as well. Where is the sympathy for Angela Rayner? Well, actually, on Mark, Me on, on, Mark, on, Mark Men on Mark Menzies as well, I mean, it obviously, look, because of the alleged quotes of bad people, etc., it's going to become the phrase of the year, isn't it? I mean, they you know, deserve it. But, yeah, they do well, deserve it, but I would actually be worried about his mental health as well at the moment, and I hope he's getting support, even I'm if worried he's about Angela Rayner's full... mental health. I'm worried about how strong a woman has to be to reach her level in politics. Literally, a woman can be as smart and successful as Angela Rayner. She can make all of this way that's did all the way from being a working class, uh, so, single mother. So, no, I, don't, I, say, I tell you, I'm a big fan of Angela Rayner. She still has to, she still has to obey the law. She will never, Stella, let me finish. For she, will never, she, she will never recover from me saying what a big fan of her. But <laughs> people would... Never mind the tax, people, that's the killer blow. People would look at her and say... I think she is someone who's worthy of admiration in politics. Mm. I do really admire her. Absolutely. I'm not joking, I genuinely admire her. But people would look at her and go, well, look, you have repeatedly called for people to resign over their tax affairs. You've repeatedly called for people to publish their tax mm. returns. You've repeatedly said that people should step down on the basis of similar allegations. So why shouldn't you? What is source for the goose is source for the gander, Angela. But do you know how hypocritical it sounds when these literal millionaires who are mates with people who have non-dom right. status so it's and okay. they are getting exactly. out so this of very week. for so thousands Stella, of It's OK pounds. not to pay your tax No, if it's not OK to not pay your tax. But <laughs> well, you know okay, what? So... When there are literal murderers out there, if, like, I did this to murderers? Matthew, I wouldn't what expect murderers? the police to come and <laughs> investigate me because maybe behind the scenes I did something more. That's all I'm saying. So basically, the, the position you are taking is it's okay not to pay your tax if you want. No, to that's not what I'm saying. The position I'm taking is you need no, enough you evidence, up. firstly, and secondly. But that's all people are saying. They're saying, show us the money, baby. That's what they're saying, Jerry Maguire style. On, on financial fraud is being, is being evaporated every year from the government coffers, and we're looking into less than yeah, 2,000. You, know, no, no, no. you can try and distract as much as you want away from this. I think there are, I, I, I say this to somebody who's a big fan of hers. I think there are legitimate questions, and the quicker Angela Rayner is fully transparent about it, the quicker the story will get away, and we can all get back to talking. Well, now about it's up to the what, police. What Keir Starmer said in yeah, Teesside. She can't now talk about the local. She election. can't publish the documents, etc. Now because it's in the hands of the police, and that would be preemptive. Of course, she can't do. Why can't she? I mean, why, why be, can't because, she? Because, because it's in the middle of a police inquiry. She's well, so got to let the police. She can't undermine the, the inquiry. She's not but I mean, I mean Stella is right. I mean, yesterday we saw that the that emerged that the one of the Tory donors that the Prime Minister has taken thirty-eight thousand pounds worth of private jet flights from has had twelve million pounds of his assets frozen. 
by the High Court in a civil case. I mean, there are much uh, bigger questions than Angela's... Civil case in a criminal case. But, look, before we... I mean, I, lo I, I love talking about Angela Rayleigh, so I'm a huge fan of hers. And just to be clear, she denies all of Absolutely. these allegations. Uh, and is protesting her innocence repeatedly and vociferously, as she does. Let me just ask you, Matthew, because I did cut you a bit short before Don't the worry. last break. Um, sit note Britain. Yeah. I think this is quite smart politics from the Prime Minister. I hear from Tim Montgomery, people may have stopped listening, but actually, talking about Conservative politics, this will appeal to Conservative voters. Um, where does the Labour Party go with this? I, I actually saw on the story the sort of slight mixed quotes. Uh, the shadow uh, work and pension secretary say, they're, they're, you know, this is a poor solution to what is a real problem. They weren't supportive. Uh, where does the Labour Party go on this? So, look, I mean, th you said uh, in your introduction on the issue that it was... Uh, you, you thought the, the Tories had talked about it in 2010. Well, of course, welfare to work and getting people uh, off benefits and into, into work, even if they need supporting, it was a big, a big Labour policy. So Labour needs to own this, but the devil's in the detail. And crucially, what we haven't talked about is all the people on NHS waiting lists uh, who are waiting in pain, who can't do the work they want to do because they're waiting for their, uh, their treatment. Maybe they're waiting for their GP to sign off the next-door neighbour. Some of you have been getting in touch. We love hearing from me here on Talk TV, 0344 499 1000. Keep those calls coming in. Tom, in rugby, wants to talk about the Prime Minister's plan to deal with sick note Britain. Tom, thank you so much for calling into the show. Hi, Jake. Look, Hi. everyone's missing something fairly obvious, and that is that the GPs are, have got no interest whatsoever in policing the benefit system. They've got far too much else to do. If you just think about the numbers, if a GP was to see every person who claims, oh, I've got mental health issues, I'm stressed, then they do nothing else. So what happens is these people just ring up the surgery, they say, I'm too stressed to work, can I get signed off, please? And the receptionist says yes, and they never get near a GP. Um, we've got personal experience of this in a, a small charity that, that I'm associated with. We've had at least three young, fit young people who've not turned up to work, who've simply rung out their GP mm. uh, surgery, got a sick note, and been signed off. But, to Tom, that's that what the Prime Minister is trying to stop, isn't it? I mean, I, I understand GPs are hard-pressed and sometimes it may just be easier to say yes to someone who's very insistent about getting a sick note than to really sort of not see other patients while, while you interrogate them. But that's what the Prime Minister is trying to stop. So do you support this idea that GPs will no longer be able to do this? Oh, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think the GPs will be delighted to do it, really. But I think what's being proposed, well, I've not really got the detail yet, I just don't think it will work because of the numbers will be absolutely huge. You'll have to set up a vast bureaucracy to run it. Yeah. Um, and these people are going to be just as bullied and catarred by all those who've claimed they've got mental health issues and can't work. Um, and I know that. I mean, some of it, I know one case recently was, frankly, fraudulent. The individual stated she couldn't work. She was too stressed to even leave the house, except that her house was empty for two weeks. Um, and she just kept turning up these sick notes. Um, but it'll be very well, Tom. To it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue, but it sounds like you think that the prime minister's diagnosed the problem, but maybe can't quite write the prescription for the cure. Thank that, you I very think, much for calling in. We do appreciate you getting in touch with us here on Talk TV. Coming up, we're going to be having a chat about Kemi Badenoch, who has come out with a new equalities crackdown. I'm Jake Berry, and you're watching Talk TV. See you straight after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Jake Berry and you're with Talk TV. And we want to hear from you today on 0344 499 1000. How do we stop naughty MPs getting into trouble? We want the wisdom of the crowd watching and listening to Talk TV to tell us, because I can tell you I've been there for 14 years and I've got no idea. So we want to hear from you. Uh, Kemi Badnock, the business secretary, today has come out and slammed company equality quotas. She seems to have forgotten slightly that it was something introduced by the Conservative Party, but apparently it is bad for business. If you have over 251 employees, you have to do a equality quota report every year. Now, joining me now is Reem Ibrahim, communications officer at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Lovely to see you again. Thank you for joining us here on the show. Tell us a little bit about what Kemi's slamming today. Yes, yeah, so she's effectively saying that she wants to kill off these plans to impose equality quotas on larger businesses. So we already have gender pay gap reporting, which requires every business in the UK to report if they have a gender pay gap, if they've got more than 250 employees. Now, what she's saying is that she wants to scrap these plans is by the Financial Conduct Authority and also the Prudential Regulation Authority. And they've consulted on requiring all companies with more than 250 employees, not just report on gender, but also other demographic data such as you know, age, sexual orientation, religion. And this is, again, not just about pay, but the number of employees that they have. So it is further extending these kind of regulations around, around these di di different diversity demographic uh, ideas. Now, the reason why this is so important and the reason why I think it's such a bad idea and the reason why I think Kemi Badenoch is absolutely right to criticise it and try and scrap it is it doesn't have the intended effect that we want. If the entire idea behind this is actually to say we're going to be more transparent, we're going to get these companies to come out and actually show us the kind of people that they're employing. But what it does, it doesn't take into account key differentials. So, for example, uh, EasyJet has been under fire for having a gender pay gap of over 50 percent. And on the surface, that looks really bad. It's like, wow, men are being paid on average 50 percent more than women. But actually, when you scratch below the surface, the reason for that is because there are more female uh, flight attendants and more male pilots. And of course, there is a huge gender pay gap between Reem, those two jobs. Isn't, 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 isn't that it? Well, two points about it. First of all, my political memory only goes back so far, but I did actually think that it was Theresa May who encouraged this to be introduced. So what you're saying is Kemi Badenoch saying, you know, the question I first of all say to Kemi is who proposed it in the first place? I've always thought this is virtue signalling nonsense and the government should get out of the way of business and let, go, and let businesses get on with making money for their shareholders and pay more tax. Get rid of this virtue signalling bunkum. But it was, Absolutely. I think, Theresa May who, in, who insisted on it in the first place. So what does Kemi have to say about that? 
Well, well, this is exactly it, right? Kemi is a conservative minister, and she sort of spoke about the fact that, uh, it, you know, being business secretary and also being co uh, women in equalities minister has meant that those things come into crossover. And actually, sometimes she has to kill off bad ideas, and this being one of them. But the reason why this isn't just virtue signaling nonsense, this is dangerous and actually damaging to the very people it's intended to protect. For example, if a company it wants to employ more ethnic minorities or more women that tend to do take up part-time work as a result of their flexible working arrangements. Women often become mothers, which is why they're more likely to take up that kind of part-time flexible work. Companies are going to be more likely to A, either just not hire them in the first place, or B, they're going to try and outsource that work and give them a more inflexible kind of unstable contracts. And so actually, in turn, this kind of stuff, whilst it's intended to help women and ethnic minorities and, and sec minorities of sexual orientation, it often does the opposite and the unintended consequences tend to be dangerous. Well, Rhea, I, th I think it goes further than that, because what I say is the government is stick to your knitting. We've got record... NHS waiting times, we've got record number of out of work sickness benefits, we're about to potentially have World War III kicking off and we've got smaller armed forces and the entirety of the New York Police Department. Why on earth is the government interfering in this nonsense? Let business get on and do business. But um, let me ask on the other side of the argument, we're always trying to get a bit of balance here on Talk TV. Um, do you think that women's, the cause of the gender pay gap, which is completely wrong, obviously, people should be paid the same amount regardless of their gender for doing the same job, has been helped or hindered by the gender pay gap publications, particularly uh, in larger companies? It's been hurt. And I will say this, there is no proof that there is a significant gender pay gap in this country. Now, no doubt there are probably women that are not being paid enough and probably men that are not being paid enough as a result of the unfairness within their own individual companies. But it has been illegal since the 1970s to pay men and women differently for the same work. The point is that when men and women are doing different types of work, many women become mothers. And so they often take up part time work. They're significantly more likely to do so. And I think that's something that's fine. It's, it's their choice to do so and it's something that they should be allowed to do the gender pay gap i mean it's it's not necessarily hugely important in media at the moment but it used to be and women used to be told growing up that they will not be able they will not earn the same amount well, of Rima, money as uh, i think i think people might say the reason we don't talk about it so much is because there has been this publication and it has in many cases got better thank you so much for joining us here on talk tv we love hearing from you Quickly, Stella, because we are running into the news. Uh, do you think this is something which is good or bad? I will shock you. I actually agree with a lot of what Rim says. I do think equality quotas are not always helpful. And I do think that they Do you agree with be... anything I say about it? Um, yes, I think... Oh, my goodness. Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> I think they can be quite patronising and virtue signalling and just a way for companies to say, look at all of these things we're doing for you. I women, think they're very necessary. And then the ethnic minorities were being so nice to you. But at the same time, I do think that there needs to be a way for... What is going to change the culture is to have more strong women who feel like they are able to speak up when they work in a company and they're not stifled by whatever culture that is. Nobody's and ever going to let me tell us. Right, we're going to have to leave it there. Let me summarise well. it. Stella agrees with me. Coming <laughs> up in the next hour, we're going to talk about Nicola Sturgeon. Husbands has been charged and Labour has some new housing plans about building more homes. I'm Jake Berry, you're with and watching and listening to Talk TV. See you straight after this. Stella. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Jake Berry, Conservative MP and former Conservative Party Chairman. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, escalation in the Middle East. US officials have told American media that Israeli missiles have struck Iran earlier this morning. Iranian authorities say that they intercepted at least three drones. The Israeli military has refused to comment. Former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Morrell, has been charged with embezzlement of funds as part of the police investigation into the SNP's finances. And Sir Keir Starmer has accused the government of creating a housing emergency as he sets out Labour's golden rules for building on the green belt. You can give me a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 87222, or tweet us on x at Talk TV. But first, let's get the news headlines with Miranda Shulker. Good morning. Iran says it has no plans for immediate retaliation after Israel launched overnight airstrikes near the Iranian city of Isfahan. Iran's state media says three drones were shot down. Iran's Tasnim news agency has posted these pictures of Isfahan's nuclear facility, saying the city is safe and sound. Rishi Sunak's refused to speculate until the facts become clear. We have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister's called for an end to the UK's sick note culture in a major speech on welfare reform. He says the focus must shift now to what work people might be able to do after concerns that some are being unnecessarily written off as sick. The PM says he wants people with less severe mental health issues to engage in the world of work. Children as young as five are spending time often unsupervised on social media. Regulator Ofcom says 38% of kids now use platforms including TikTok, WhatsApp and Instagram. It's thought nearly a quarter of UK five to seven year olds now have their own smartphone. And a woman's been jailed for 14 weeks for stalking Harry Styles. 35-year-old Myra Carvalho, who was staying at a hostel in south-west London, is said to have sent the former One Direction singer 8,000 cards in less than a month. She's been issued with a restraining order and has been banned from seeing him perform. You're up to date with the headlines. Now for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we're likely to see some drier, brighter conditions over the weekend at long last. Uh, but it's a bit of a showery end to the week. We've got uh, rain spreading its way southwards. It's going to leave quite a few showers through central areas and down towards the southeast. But those skies clearing from the north, not terribly warm temperatures, 13 or 14 at best in the sunnier west. But eastern coast, pretty chilly values in single figures. And to go with that, a brisk northerly wind. And then as we go through this evening and overnight, those clear skies are going to allow our temperatures to tumble. So the risk of a grass frost for many and one or two pockets of air frost as well. Only those eastern areas where we will see more in the way of cloud and we've got more of a breeze going on are likely to remain frost free. But thereafter, we're looking at a sunny morning, a bright start to Saturday, and we'll see some uh, fine weather throughout the day. We maintain this rather brisk northerly wind that's going to push some cloud over those north sea coasts, and some of that will make its way inland, spreading its way westwards. So we're looking at sunny spells and also times of cloud. Western areas seeing the best of the weather, but temperatures still on the low side, just making double figures for most. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back. I'm Jake Berry and you're with Talk TV. And today we are asking you, after yet more of my colleagues have been in the headline for bad behaviour as MPs, how do we clean up politics? We keep hearing these stories. In fact, 18 members of Parliament currently have some form of suspension over them. How do we stop this happening? Give me a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or tweet us on x at Talk TV. Joining me now to run through all of the top stories are former Labour advisers, they've put two of them with me today, <laughs> Stella Chandikidu and Matthew Lazar. Thanks very much for sticking with us, guys. Um, well, let's start by talking about the big story of the day, which isn't the bad behaviour of MPs of all parties, but is this worrying news overnight that Israel has retaliated uh, after the attack by Iran on Israel last Saturday. And Stella, look, we always talk about escalation in relation to the Middle East, Gaza, Israel and the wider conflict and instability we see in that region. How nervous should we be about this Israeli action over last night. Given who is Prime Minister of Israel, we should be quite nervous because I don't think that Netanyahu has proven that he's a politician who can be trusted in the international community. He's not someone who can be trusted to take international peace and security seriously. He's looking out for his political career first and foremost. He may want us to believe that he's taking care of Israel's interest, but at this point it seems to me like the interest that he's taken the best care of is his own political career. Now, I think what's very interesting about what's happening right now is that at the same time that you have countries that, as we said, they are ha we, we, in the UK and in the US, we have upcoming general elections. Politicians are very, very distracted. You have cost of living crisis. You have the war in Ukraine com continuing. You have all of these other very, very big problems. Nonetheless, the domestic problems, which are completely on fire. Mm -hmm. And you have politicians who need to focus their minds in a situation that could make everything absolutely worse. And you have a public as well who is going to be asked to make even more difficult, uh, difficult, uh, difficult decisions because what is happening in, Iran, in, in Iran right now is also something that's going to have eventually an impact on energy prices, which is going to have a worse impact on so the cost of the living prices. You've seen the FTSE collapse, haven't you, yeah. over the last couple of days? Uh, well, look, we're going to hear more about this because joining me now is Director of the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Centre, Richard Pater. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Can you enlighten our viewers and listeners and say what's been happening overnight in relation to these attacks? What do we actually know? Thank you for having me. I mean, first of all, I will stress that uh, officially Israel is not making any comments on this. So this is mostly based on international sources. And so I would just urge everyone to just be a little bit cautious because at this moment in time, so soon after the event, uh, things, are, things are far from clear. But it appears there was a strike on an Air Force base uh, in this, in the, close to the city of Isfahan in, in, in Iran. This was one of the bases in which launched this very uh, nasty and, uh, and, and quite unprecedented attack 
on early Sunday morning when we saw these 300 devices, both cruise and ballistic missiles, along with UAVs, launched on Israel. So I think this was just a small taster, a very small uh, retaliatory response um, to, the, to the point of fire that sent the message that Israel, if it was indeed Israel, has the capacity um, and the technology, the wherewithal to strike inside Iran and knows exactly where these bases and these military targets are. Do you think Iran would be uh, justified at striking back following this attack? I think they should be very cautious indeed. I think we saw also the most significant aspect for me on Saturday night was that Israel's allies rallied, rallied to their defence, obviously including the, uh, the Royal Air Force alongside, alongside the US and other regional powers um, like Jordan, that there is a strong consensus within the region that Iran is a very dangerous threat both in terms of conventional weaponry and also in their desire, ability to, to, uh, to attain nuclear military capability. And I think that's a threat not just for Israel, but for the wider world. Yeah, I, I mean, Richard, you haven't actually answered the question, so I'll put it, I'll put it to you again, because look, Iran would say, and I, I'm no fan of Iran, I think they're a very dangerous and uh, terrible uh, country, but Iran would say there was an attack on their consul uh, it, I, and one of their senior leaders was killed, and that was the justification for them attacking Israel. Israel has now allegedly, we understand, attacked Iran. Why should Iran, you know, this gets to the point of escalation. Why should, why should Iran not be justified now at striking back at Israel? This is the problem with this situation. It could so easily get out of hand. Surely Israel, as President Biden has said, should have taken the win in shooting down those, those drones and other missiles that were directed to it on the 13th uh, of this month, surely it should have taken the win and not responded in this way. Well, let me make, make a couple of points. First, first, first of all, um, I think that if there was a policy debate here in Israel that when after following the attack from Sunday morning, there is a necessity for Israel to, to uh, in order to bolster its deterrence and send a clearer message to Iran that a defensive a defensive response is not enough, that it needs to inflict a, a price for these things. And that the question of what the price is and the calibration is, uh, is, is part of that policy dilemma here. But secondly, this didn't just begin on, uh, on, on, Sunday, on Sunday morning. Israel has been, in, in a sense, in a shadow war with Iran and with Iranian um, proxies in the region for almost a decade now, perhaps even further back, going back to the Iranian revolution, when they laid out that Israel is the, the small state, and sometimes it's the UK, sometimes it's Israel, and that they have, as a revolu revolutionary a radical ideology, the essence of kind of permanent revolution and consistently attacking. We've seen since October the 8th, Iranian proxies in the north constantly on a daily basis um, targeting, targeting, uh, targeting Israeli, uh, the, north, the north of Israeli. There are still citizens there in the north that have been displaced from their homes for six months, and these attacks continue. So I think you have to widen the prism a little bit and understand that there are a range of responses that Iran and its proxies continues to attack Israel, and that's why Israel feels the need to respond. Yeah, OK, well, that, that, that's, that's really helpful. So do you think it's likely that we will, we will see a further response. I mean, we've had a quite long debate about whether it's proportionate for Iran to respond. But do you, do you hope that this is the end, end of it in, in terms of this initial sort of direct conflict between Iran and Israel? You're right to say that there's been a significant war carried on through proxies uh, by Iran. But do you think this should be the end of it now? I mean, I, I'd be careful to, to, to assess the future. None of us are, none of us are prophets. Um, we, the, the hope is that this thing, this latest uh, retaliation, if it was Israel, will be the end of this current episode. Although, as I said at the beginning, there is real concern that the Iranians pose a, uh, a, a real threat to Israel. And I think Israel is best served by coordinating their responses with their allies in the region and their strong Western allies as well to have a unified and united front if Iran dares to, uh, to attack again. But in the meantime, as I said before, there is this constant threat from the other proxies, both from Syria, from Lebanon, from Iraq, from the Houthis in Yemen, from their attempts to infiltrate into the West Bank and set that alight as well. So sadly, unfortunately, this conflict is, is ongoing and we can only hope for, uh, for a reduction in violence for, for as long as possible.
Richard, thank you very much for joining us here on Talk TV and talking to us about what is a very important issue. Matthew, look, um, the, I think the big question that we should try and address here for our viewers and listeners at home is, would it be proportionate for... I, I can't really see a reason why Iran wouldn't fight back. Now, there might be many, many reasons, including the fact that they, they, they don't want to get in a wider conflict, but I don't think it would be wrong, necessarily, for them to fight back having been subject to this attack, do you? Oh, well, I think there's certainly going to be uh, a real feeling that double standards uh, are here from the West, that it's OK for one, well, one country, Israel, if it's attacked, uh, to respond, but not for another country, in this case, Iran, to respond that it's not going to attack. And, if, and I think that puts a lot of pressure on inside countries. I mean, I think we're going to see... We saw, you know, um, Muslim voters' opinion really outraged over uh, uh, what's happening in Gaza. Obviously, a humanitarian crisis, but people are going to be saying, you know, let's uh, apply the same standards to everybody, even if we find Iran a very uh, uncomfortable government and we don't want it to have a nuclear weapon. But it does have the right to defend itself, surely. Um, you can argue. OK, well, look, we're not going to solve it here on Talk TV. We always try, but we're not going to solve it just today because we want a bit of time for the joy of text. Thank you for everyone who has been getting in touch on 8722 to talk, I'll talk with the big question we're asking you, and we, we really want to know is following another raft of allegations against one of my former colleagues now, who's lost the whip, Mark Menzies, adding to the 18 serving members of parliament who are currently whipless, i.e. they've been kicked out of their political party for some form of bad behaviour. How do we clean up politics? How did we do it? And we've got the joy of text. We've got loads of people texting. I'm going to start. Sue, <laughs> your moment to shine. <laughs> name it. I'm just doing this so Matthew and Stella don't have a go at me about You've it. robbed us of our moment. Sue. By getting rid of wannabe TV presenters like Jake Barron and replacing them with serious people who believe in public service like Angela Rayner. Well, what I would say is, Sue, thank you for getting in touch. Always happily take all criticism and praise in equal measure. I do believe in public service. I'm proud to serve the people of Rosendale and Darwin. And I think if you look at the other stories in the news about Angela Rayner, you might think that she's more focused on self-service. But oh. obviously, oh. she denies all the allegations. Stella, over to you. Very brave of you, Jake. You just showed what a great presenter you are by exactly. not being afraid to... Totally. To, Take them on. To, yeah. to, Take to tell on. the truth, you know. Okay. Get attacking first. Plenty of really good texts. I really like Alex's text, which says, Max net worth, five million per entire family. If you reach it while serving, you're automatically out. Maximum of two terms. Okay. If the voting record doesn't match the constituency to at least 75%, you are automatically ineligible for the second term. Automatic disclosure of all campaign funds and must wear badges of significant funder's name on label when acting in MP capacity. Okay, so still, look, so, this, this is not tearing over for you. We've had the, this is not our first discussion about this. So, do you agree that rich people should be precluded from? Being MPs. No, I don't. I, okay, well, I, no, I don't think they do should be. But text, I do though? think there is no reason for billionaires to exist. They shouldn't exist. So, well, is it... there needs to be. I, I think that globally, we like not... no one human being. It's not healthy for the for their soul, for their personality, oh. for the planet, for our communities. It's no good news for anyone. Nobody needs to be is a billionaire. Is there any such thing as a good billionaire? Hard ceiling. Hard ceiling. Is there any such thing as a good billionaire? Um, it's not about being good or bad. The I'm, not good the I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just Stella, saying I'm they're so disappointed. Souls. I thought we'd see Bill Gates. a flash of a blue sock by Stella before the break, saying that she agreed with me. I thought we were going to bring her over to the to the to the uh, the side of the Jedi's, but apparently she's remaining on the dark side. Matthew. <laughs> um, I'm going to read uh, a couple a bit quickly because they both, interestingly, think MPs should be paid more. Mickey says pay them, all MPs, I think that means, a Prime Minister's salary, well, uh, doubling the Prime Minister's salary himself, make it so they can't work other jobs, stop claiming of the taxpayer, live in the area you represent and be held legally accountable at all times. And Gav says pay politicians 250000 a year but make them accountable for all of their actions, make them answer questions to the public once a month, no income from other sources, and they're able to be unelected every six months or so. Unelected every six months? Okay, I think Unelected, I think it means have the... Have kick them out, kick them out, kick them out. Well, you know my view the on MPs pay? Link it to economic growth and then we would be one of the fastest growing economies in the world if MPs got a pay cut every time the economy went into recession. And do the same for the civil servants as well because a failure of the economy is a failure well, What about the commentators? No, oh, comment, commentary, absolutely. Any, I'll give you one more, Stella. OK. Uh, I, I, did, I did... There was one that I really liked, uh, because it is very normal. Um, uh, 
uh, Cody said, have a method to bring in a better cross-section of the public as MPs. Encourage everyone to be heard. Yes. That's it, we can which all unite around think, that. Yes, which is why I think we need to have, you know, more participation from the public and we need to have a wider range more of people like Angela becoming Rainer. MPs. More people well, like do you know what? I'll tell you the one thing I would do is get rid of these professional politicians, people who've never had a real job. If you want to become a member of parliament, you should have to put your CV on the ballot paper. And if that CV includes, I have worked in politics, all I've done is been a special advisor, not that there's anything wrong with that, Matthew, a special advisor, I'm a professional politician, you should be banned from standing to election. We want people in politics who's got real life experience, whether that's being a young single mother like Angela Rayner, or a lawyer, or a teacher, or a scaffolder, or, or a, a TV doctor, producer, like or a hairdresser, <laughs> whatever it is, real people in politics. Get rid of these amoebas we have in both the <laughs> Conservative and the Labour Party. <laughs> No, no, the, they, they, so every political party's got them, these professional No, no we politics. certainly need Fire a massively them, more... Get rid of them, get them out, real people, time for people's politics, none of this I agree, professional actually. nonsense. I mean, you know, I saw a lot of people, when I was involved in student and youth politics, a lot of people from my generation never had a, a, any shred of a proper job, went straight into parliament. Well, some of them have even have been spat out the other side <laughs> some already. Some of them shut out, so true. <laughs> anyway, look. <laughs> Uh, we'll get back to the news. That's the rant of the day. That should be another thing. Your joy of taste. Rant, rant of, the of the day. Um, getting back uh, to the news. Else? Speaking of flashing a bit of ankle, oh, I was amused to read in the anymore. Telegraph that um, the EU apparently is ankle flashing. I think it's gone beyond that. I think it's exposure of full uh, European branded knickers. Beyond, uh, the, but anyway, to Keir Starmer saying, well, basically, if you win the general election, we're going to restore freedom of you to people under 30. Now, Matthew, tell me. Yeah. I actually think it's quite a good idea. Um, but tell me why it should only be to people below the age of 30. So why shouldn't it be to everyone? And is this a good thing or a bad thing for Keir Starmer? So actually, I think it is uh, a difficult thing for Keir Starmer because uh, the scheme is basically, the reason to answer your first question about why it's under 30 is it's basically modelled on the scheme that we and some other countries have. We have it particularly with Australia uh, and New Zealand. We know, we know people, young people come here, pull, pull a pint, uh, 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 you know, um, fill jobs. And similarly, our people go... It's, it's, people a, go it's a cultural exchange It's a cultural exchange, essentially, it? yeah. It's to give people yeah. a taste of, the, uh, uh, of different, uh, different cultures. That's why it's under because Australia is such a different country. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. It, it, I mean, there is obviously a reason, you know, people would say, well, why is it only restricted to Australia and New Zealand? Is there a bit of racism here? Obviously, they're more diverse countries than they used to be. But anyway, that's the, the that's why it's a, a target of the under 30s. What the political difficulty for Keir Starmer is, it's a perfectly sensible idea. I think there's quite a lot of agreement with it. But Keir Starmer can't be seen to do anything that inches us in any way closer to the EU because Labour is petrified of upsetting... Uh, no, no, uh, but his uh, entire uh, history in politics is trying to stop and reverse Brexit. It was. I mean, no, it is really now. It was. It is. Whether you think Keir Starmer is, you know, brilliant or not, it is absolutely undeniable that he campaigned repeatedly, not only to make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister, but to reverse yeah, Brexit. No, absolutely. Through a second he referendum. Can't, he can't shy away so from when that. he talks about this, the British public go, ah, you've got form on this, you're going to become our Prime Minister and you're going to reverse Brexit. Exactly. Which the Labour Party... It plays into that fear because of, because of his record uh, about a second referendum yeah. and rejoining. It plays into that fear. So in order to try and counter uh, that image of him, uh, his previous image of him as being a, uh, a Ramona, to use that awful phrase that was around at the time, uh, he therefore is bending over backwards to uh, appear to be as hostile as possible to any closer links with the EU. But Even so if it's a sensible idea. You know, as, as a younger person, I am uh, would, would you definitely think under this 30. Sort of, this sort of cultural exchange, I mean, it's something I think we should encourage. I think it's fantastic. But do you think it's something we should encourage for all our young people to be able to visit Europe for four years, I think the proposal I think, is, I think without it's a, restriction? I think it's, it's, it's a completely positive policy. I think even Brexiteers would be in favour of this because Brexiteers, after all, a lot of them are parents and they will see the benefit that this would have for younger people. I completely understand their electoral politics and why Labour would see this as the kind of thing that could end up being a distraction as they're going into their pre-election campaign. But I think it's a very good policy and I think that a lot of young British people feel like they're missing yeah, out. Yeah, no, Salah, I, I, I actually completely agree with you. What I don't really understand is why this is the EU wooing the Labour Party. Surely it's just wooing the British I think that's government the journalist for the British it. electorate by saying, woohoo. Here's I our, here's was a bit our confused EU about that as well. I was a bit around. confused why it was all only... Uh, it, it, uh, the first time this story was briefed, it was the EU will let this happen if Labour is in government, as if they cannot ask the current 
I mean, partly it's because the government is running out of time and they're assuming a Labour government is the next government. Yeah. Government. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think what's interesting is the uh, the Tory government are trying to do this with individual countries uh, in Europe, but that's not going to happen because they because individual countries always want to stay together on on this issue and not upset they won't upset the Commission. So um, good luck with trying to negotiate uh, you know twenty odd different agreements and and trying to cherry pick the countries you want to have one with and don't want to have one with. There is actually an implication for this um, for universities because the EU is saying it will do it, but only if the young people who come here because obviously it will be a two way street uh, are classed as home students for university fees like they were in the, in the EU, which would be a big blow to universities, who, as we know, are very dependent on the now mm. tens of thousands of pounds each year from international students. But at the same time, it's become extremely expensive for EU students now to come and study in the UK. So I do think there's going to be a big impact on universities in the next few years. They will be missing out on some very bright students. Yeah. And, and, like you, and the, and like UK, me, and you would definitely be, have been missing out on me. But it, it <laughs> fundamentally misunderstands Brexit to believe people who believe in Brexit believe in isolation. They don't. They believe in sovereignty. Oh. No, they do. They believe in sovereignty. You may all you a mixture may of reasons. Change. We know it's. I'm not on doors now, referendum. It's a mixture of reasons. We know the Labour Party want to reverse Brexit. No, we well, don't. As soon as they get the keys to number, I wish we would, but we won't. Well, Keir Starmer is a bit of form on it, but from Brexit to breakfast. Oh. A mistake often made during the uh, during the breakfast. Sorry, I mean Brexit negotiations. You have a croissant. It was it was a bit like sort of Brexit bingo. That how many times would someone either get Jeremy Hunt's name wrong or call Brexit breakfast? But breakfast. I, I can't believe this. The full English is dying out because apparently Gen Zers don't own the pans to cook it. It takes too long. It's too fatty. It's too greasy. Um, Matthew, will you? Uh, be shedding a tear for the death of the full English? I would definitely shed a tear for the, the, the death of the full English. Now, of course, th there is... That actually on... isn't a full English, it's got chips. It, it's got chips on it, and a, uh, that's more of a kind of mixed grill with beans. Where, um, uh, because that beans, in my view, are a, an abomination uh, on the breakfast. Have you seen these plates you can now get, which have a, spe a special um, section built into it so that your beans don't stray on to no, but... the, rest, the rest of no, your I breakfast? I think they, they use those plates already in prisons, don't they? So the quintessential Greek breakfast is a cigarette and a frappe coffee. Yeah. Uh, and obviously shouting in the, the UK, world. you no longer are allowed to smoke cigarettes. You don't have no, frappe no, we haven't coffees. Quite it, yeah. we're, now we're you wrong. don't have. Now, now you are saying you don't even like English breakfast. Isn't, isn't Greek? Is, isn't isn't, isn't, isn't is the quintessential thing? Greek breakfast? Don't they have a Greek sausage? It's called sukkot. Is that right? Are you confusing us with Turkey oh, again? Oh, no, don't Jake. do that. I mean, Jake, Stella's been the passionate The UK has enough international security problems. <laughs> you cannot face another one. Can I just say that? You don't have the anyway, money anyway, to fight um, it. Um, so let me tell you, my favourite breakfast, anyway, is black pudding on toast, particularly baker black pudding from the best place in the world. Chadwick's. Rossendale Berry and Darwin. <laughs> no, Berry, Berry does do fine black pudding. It's not as good as baker black pudding. Stella, what's your favourite breakfast? Uh, eggs or a Smoked salmon, Hollandaise sauce. You're English very muffin. posh, Stella. Flash. Yes, I am. Flash. I Flash. try to. You say <laughs> eggs, eh, scrambled eggs and bacon, crispy bacon, scrambled, scrambled eggs, eggs. And crispy bacon. fantastic. Well, look, the full English may be dying out, but definitely not here on Talk TV today. We are asking you at home not about what you like for breakfast. That could be next week, but we're asking you with more MPs making headlines for bad behaviour. How would you clean up politics? Some of you have been getting in touch on 0344 499 1000. Keep those texts coming in. But Matt from Cheshire has taken the moment time to call us and we're delighted to be joined by Matt now live on Talk TV. Matt, thank you for calling into the show. Hi, good morning, Jake. Good morning uh, to I you. Could I first congratulate you on your uh, libertarian smoking ban uh, comments the other day? Thank you very much. Uh, there's a potential leader in there yet oh. that I didn't see previously. Uh, right, OK, well, I'll get down to the bookies. Who's the potential leader? Is that you, Matt? No, you, I Oh, mean. no, no, no. <laughs> Don't waste your money. Don't waste your money. <laughs> um, Matt, what do you think? Thank you very much. By the way, you are absolutely right. If you believe in freedom, you shouldn't believe in this nonsense smoking ban. But we're not talking about that today. How, Matt, do we clean up politics? Because all of these MPs, not just Tory, I know we love talking about Conservative MPs, but all of lots of MPs seem to keep getting in a bit of trouble. So how do we clean up politics and get the right people into Parliament? Um, mainly for Conservatives in my area, they should pick people that represent the from the constituency that they're representing and not parachute in people from other areas because they've been a long-time Conservative member and 
working class people would see £100,000 a year as a lot of money and they would probably appreciate that money and have a lot more passion for the area than people that have been parachuted in and understand the problems of that area. So rather than having people, middle, upper class people who are university educated, maybe we should have, like you said earlier, more normal, rational... Yeah. Get rid of the professional politicians. People. Whereabouts in Cheshire are you, Matt? I'm, in t I'm next door to Angela Rayner. I'm not in the posh part. I'm not in the footballer belt. I'm in, in Tameside, Greater Manchester. OK, OK, so you're in GM. Um, well, look, I don't disagree with you. I think you're absolutely right. Number one, 100 grand is a hell of a lot of money. MPs are well paid. There's no make no bones about that. I've been clear. I, I think that MPs are well paid and they should only ever get a pay rise when we get economic growth. Stop all this uprating it by inflation. Inflation is a sign of failure, actually, for a government rather than success. But number two, I absolutely agree with you, Matt. Get rid of these political flunkies who follow round existing MPs and then think that means that they're going to get a super safe seat like Tameside in Manchester if you're standing for the Labour Party or anywhere else in lots of other parts of the country if you're standing for the Conservatives. Thank you very much, Cully and Matt. I don't disagree Thanks. with a word you have said. Coming up, we are going to be discussing Nicola Sturgis' husband, who has been charged by police in Scotland. This is Talk TV. I'm Jake Berry. I'll see you straight after this break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back.
to Talk TV. I'm Jake Berry, and I really want to hear. We had a brilliant caller before we went to break saying how we clear up politics after another Member of Parliament has found themselves subject to disgrace in the Times newspaper. Give us a call. I really want to hear from you on this day. I think we can have a bit of fun with this. 0344 499 1000. Text us on 8722 or tweet us on X at Talk TV. Coming up, we are talking about Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Morell, who has now been charged by Police Scotland in relation to irregularities in SNP's finances. And joining me now is Chris McKelvey, General Secretary of the Alba Party and former SNP official. Chris, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk TV. Tell us a little bit about how the process is working, because, of course, we know that three individuals, including Nicola Sturgeon herself, were arrested some time ago. But Peter Morell, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, was re-arrested yesterday and then charged. Um, there's an active ongoing police investigation. We have to be quite careful about what we say. But what do we know that he has been charged with? Well, you're quite right to say that in Scotland, when a person is charged uh, with a criminal offence, that the case becomes active in terms of the, the Contempt of Court Act 1981. And Contempt of Court in Scotland is actually quite a bit more strict in terms of its application than in England. So really, obviously, need to be careful of any commentary or analysis at all in relation to the charges. But the, the, the matter of fact is he's been charged with embezzlement, which is effectively theft. We don't know any more details than that. Um, I think, obviously, the police have spent a lot of time um, conducting the investigation. They've now referred a report to what's known as the Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland. And I think that everyone that has justice at heart now has to just respect that process, see where it takes us. And of course, everyone, including Peter Morell, is entitled to the presumption of innocent until proven otherwise. OK, thanks for talking to us about that. We will respect, obviously, the, the, the sensitivities around it. So I'm going to ask you, where did it go wrong for Nicola Sturgeon? Because both her and her husband were really the UK's ultimate power couple. You had the leader of the Scottish Government, the First Minister of Scotland, the Chief Executive and Leader of a party. It felt at some points like, uh, you know, the SNP could sort of walk on water, defy political gravity. Nothing seemed to stick to her. And it stick to the, the SNP particularly, but particularly to Nicola Sturgeon. Where did it all start to go wrong for them? Now the SNP is languishing the polls. It's got Hamza Yous uh, Yousaf, sorry, I almost called him Hamza Useless, uh, yeah, well, as, as its leader. Think... Where did it go wrong for the SNP? It goes back to the old adage that, you know, you can you can tell people all day long that it's sunny outside, but, you know, one day they're going to walk outside and they're going to get wet in the rain. And I think that's what, un, you know, eventually was the undoing of Nicola Sturgeon, that she put style over substance. You know, and it's related to, like, the big announcement yesterday was the rollback on climate. So when Alex Salmond was the First Minister, uh, he managed to reduce emissions in Scotland by 46% of the 1990 level. You know, and, you know, that was, you know, a very difficult process, you know, like, you know, the, the, the acceptance of onshore and offshore wind farms, the, the, the transition that the majority of Scotland's electricity was generated through renewables. I mean, these weren't easy things. But then under Nicholas Sturgeon's leadership, that 46% only managed to get to 49.1% over a, you know, something like a seven-year period. And, of course, during that time, she was taking selfies with, you know, any celebrity she could find at climate conferences. And, and that's what I mean by style over substance. At the end of the day, you know, when Alec was First Minister, his government used to start every day by saying, what are we going to do today? And let's go do it. Nicola's really? government, the, 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 the way they operated was, what are we going to say today? And let's go and say it. They, they said a lot of things. They made a lot of promises. They declared a lot of emergencies and said we wanted to be world leading in lots of fields. But the reality is they never delivered on the things that they promised. And then, of course, they got themselves ultimately undone when they entered the world of gender politics, which, you know, ultimately was the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon. Well, Chris, really, really interesting to say that this is a sort of style of uh, substance in, in the way people living in Scotland were governed. Let me just pick up, I think, on this extraordinary U-turn by the SNP government. And let's not forget an SNP government propped up and in coalition with the Greens. They'd made a sort of 
uh, virtue signalling uh, hope that they would be able to reduce emission, be 70% of the way or 75% of the way to net zero by 2030. I mean, what? I mean, that was a full handbrake turn, U-turn that they had to, you know, do in the Scottish Parliament yesterday. I mean, um, the, the, this leader of the Scottish uh, Labour Party, Anna Sawa, eviscerated Hamza Youssef in the Scottish Parliament yesterday. This is a national humiliation, surely, to have set this overambitious virtue signalling target and just have had it the rug torn from under you. Well, we have a Green Party in government in Scotland, so it's it's quite astounding. It does beg the question of what will they be willing to accept and sell their souls for if they're willing to, you know, scrap green targets to, to stay in government. You know, it was 2009 that Alex Salmond actually created the world's first climate change legislation. And, you know, that is only 15 years ago, but if you can think back to then, you know, we, we have changed as a society so much, you know. People used to put all their waste in one bin. We all now embrace recycling. You know, and I just, I don't accept the argument that people just, they're not interested in the environment. I think everyone cares about the environment, but we want to understand what we're being asked to do, how much it's going to cost us to do it, and, you know, what are we going to have to sacrifice to do it? You know, I'll give you a good example of why the Scottish government haven't met their targets the Scottish Government cut £200 million from the affordable housing budget. So that's a budget that could have built modern homes, uh, they could have been energy efficient, and they transferred that money into an active travel scheme. And that scheme is effectively spent every penny of that building cycle lanes. Now, I'm all for people that want to cycle, but I don't see how you save the planet by allowing effectively you know, a group of privileged middle-class people to be able to cycle through town centres when you could have instead invested that money in some of the most poorest people in society, giving them quality housing, affordable housing, which is cheap to heat. I mean, these are the big ticket items that can help save the environment. And, you know, the SNP themselves, they've, they've poured cold water on Scotland's North Sea oil and gas industry for the last eight years. And that, that's allowed the UK government to go off the hook because one of the biggest game changers in saving the planet, meeting Scotland's climate targets, and in fact helping deliver Europe's climate targets would be carbon capture. But because the Scottish Government have been so, you know, hostile to the North Sea oil and gas industry, they've allowed Richie Sunak off the hook when he can say, well, I'll promise I'll deliver a, a carbon capture scheme, that's the ACORN scheme in the North Sea, and then one year later, we've not seen a single pound of Rishi Sunak's money. So, I mean, these are the big things that, you know, as an independent supporter, I would love to see is be an independent country so that we can just get on with, you know, putting net zero requirements on every license on the North Sea. We can, Even you know, though, Chris, I'm sure you'd accept that in terms of the SNP's performance, they completely uh, failed to make the progress, that the tar hit the target they set themselves. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Really interesting to hear from you on a broad range of subjects there. Stella, um, that is the problem, isn't it, with left-wing governments like the Scottish Nationalist Party, Scottish National Party and the Greens in coalition. You can set all the virtue signalling targets you want, but if the cold, hard reality is that you don't concentrate on delivery or maybe even you don't have the resource to concentrate on delivery, it's just nonsense, isn't it? This U-turn is humiliating for Hamza use. I wouldn't put all left-wing uh, governments in the same bracket. But yes, I, I agree. So much of the S&P has been over their years on, on so many issues, not just net zero, on also on, on austerity as well. They keep on complaining about things as if it's another party that is in government and not them. And we've seen them doing it over and over again. And they are constantly looking at Westminster to put the blame on them. And they are saying one thing to their voters and doing something completely else. And they've been found out. They've been found out, Matthew. And this is really going to serve the Labour Party well at the next general election. Yeah. Because Anna Sawa is doing a really good job. Anna Sawa is, uh, is, 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 is a, is a is real a great star. Leader. Absolutely. He's a total, new Labour movement. total star. Um, he has, you know, he disagrees with Keir on some issues, but he does so in a good-natured uh, 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 way. Uh, I mean, Anna, Anna snails it. He's uh, re really one of the stars of the party. I could be a future leader of UK Labour. Cut his teeth here on Talk TV. And he's a dentist. He used, used to be a regular panellist with him. Anyway, some of you have been getting in touch on 0344 499 1000. Keep those calls coming in because we're now going to hear from Robert in Glasgow who thinks the media is over-hyping the story about Angela Rayner. Robert, um, you, you think we need to leave poor old Angela alone then? Yeah. Good morning, Jake. Thanks for listening to me. It's not, it's not so much the, the, 
What Angela Rayner, the four of us, AJ, all of our 80s, and we're going off our head listening to this, this AT television coverage. She declared herself that she will resign if found guilty. There is 12 detectives checking up on it. But, Robert, she hasn't quite has said that. Let me, let, me just, let me just put the fact to you is what she said is she will resign if she has committed a, quote, criminal offence. I think lots yeah. of people watching the show would say that even if she hasn't committed a criminal offence, i.e. she is not charged and found guilty of a criminal offence, if she is found to have lied, to have avoided paying uh, capital gains tax, which may not be criminal, may just see a fine, and, of course, let's remind ourselves that she denies all of those allegations, that she should go anyway. So you, you agree with her that it's only if she's committed a crime that she should have to step down? No, no, as far as, Jake, as far as we can read into it, she said she will step down if found guilty of any fault. That's no, of a criminal offence, Robert. It's really important. She gave a clear statement last Friday saying, if I have committed a criminal offence. Well, why, Jake, then? The 12 detectives can through the whole system. Now, why, especially the early morning presenters, they're, they're a headache, by the way. Why should they be? Why, why should it be television coverage now? Now, we're, we're, we're convinced because, as you know, Jake, in Scotland, we would never have, never have a Tory government anyway. Now, the thing is, we think it's just Tory canvassing. OK. Tory. Well, Robert, look, thank you for calling in. You've made your views really clear. That's why we love hearing from people here on Talk TV. I think Robert disagrees with me, but lots of people do. But that shouldn't stop you calling into the show on 0344 499 1000. Coming up next on the show, we're going to talk about the Labour Party and their housing plans to build on what they call the Grey Belt. Everyone else calls it the Green Belt. But they're trying to create a distinction in your mind. We can talk about that straight after this break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Jake Berry, and I want to hear from you today. We're, we haven't had enough phone calls about why MPs are so badly behaved. A lot of texts about it, most of them criticising me, but we want to hear from you on 0344 499 1000. Why are MPs such naughty boys and girls, and what can we do to encourage them to be better? Now, my friends, Keir Starmer has announced another emergency. We've gone from a climate emergency to an emergency about standards in public life, all sorts of emergencies. This time, we have a housing emergency. And Keir Starmer has let us know that his big idea is that there are rundown bits of the Greenbelt, old petrol stations, scrapyards, former sewage works, which quite wrongly are not developed for housing to help us build more housing for people. So he has relabeled this the Grey Belt, and he wants us to know that the Labour Party, if they win the general election, will develop on the Grey Belt but only after they have built on all of the brownfield sites first. So their policy is brownfield first, grey belt next. What well, after that? Well, no one knows. But joining me now is Millie Dodd, Senior Communications Minister at Just Build Homes. Maybe Millie knows. Millie, thank you very much for joining us here on the show. Um, I assume you're quite supportive of this idea of building houses on uh, d degraded and uh, dilapidated bits of the green belt and, and making them available for younger people to buy. Yeah, I think it's a really in interesting initiative that holds the promise of addressing our severe housing shortage. Right. As you mentioned, there are brownfield sites within the green belt, sites that already have buildings on them, which we could bring forward to deliver more homes. But Millie, that's already the law, isn't it? It's passed in the Localism Act 2011. The local authorities are actually free to release uh, damaged bits of green belt, non-green bits of green belt from the green belt, build houses on them, and uh, as long as they replace the green belt with the sort of the field next to it, which may be pristine. So what more do you think this will do to build more houses when in fact it's already the case? I think that there's a really big misconception about what the green belt actually is, especially with the general public. I think a lot of the time when the green belt's mentioned, people think of green fields and open space, but in fact, it's just the term to stop urban sprawl between, between cities. And having this new term to kind of separate this and highlight that there are these sites that can be brought forward, I think could really help. In so, okay, so Millie, so you think it is the, the coining of a term, the grey belt, that will get more houses built. I'll just put to you, it is already the law of the land that houses can be built in the green belt if it is a former scrapyard or a petrol station or, you know, not this sort of pristine sort of woodland or, or fields. So I put it to you again, all Keir Starmer is doing is stating what is already the law of the land. How is that going to get more houses built for younger people? Well, I think that any initiative that is supporting new homes is a really big step forward. I think it's really great that Labour are coming out and taking the housing crisis seriously. And I think it would be really good if um, other kind of parties brought forward policies that publicise the but housing Millie, crisis. Wait, sorry, we don't have to bring forward policies. This is already the law. This is already the law of England. Why do we have to bring out new laws which say, because this is already the law. This is my point. It won't build any more houses. I support it, which is why I voted for it. I was in the department that made this the law back in 2011. How is this going to get more houses built? Yeah, I mean, we're not building enough houses as it is. So I think that by, by coming out and saying that they're going to do brownfield first, is more about getting people to be more supportive of house building. We okay. know it's a massive problem that when people suggest new developments, hundreds of people object. And by saying that they're going to do brownfield first and then kind of focus on this new grey belt, I think it's a really good thing for the public perception. Okay, of well, Millie, you're, you're not here as a spokesman to the Labour Party. Of course, brownfield first is already policy. Would you like to see more political parties, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, all of the major political parties, be even more radical than this. For a long time, I've believed that the way we build more houses in this country is actually to build on green fields, or even in some cases, the green belt, and create new towns. Now, if we had a, a radical policy from any of the political parties, not a political point I make, which said, look, we are going to build 10, 15, 20,000 houses in this, in this new area where there isn't anything at the moment, and build all the infrastructure, do you think they're the sort of radical ideas that would get Britain building again? 
Yeah, I, I mean, we need more homes of all types. I think the, the, the garden communities and all of these big developments are great, but ultimately we have a massive housing shortage and we need all types of development to keep going forward and to be approved to help get the homes we need approved and built. Millie, I agree with you. Who do you think is to blame for the lack of planning permissions coming forward? Do you think it's the government or do you think it's local councils who are refusing to grant the planning permissions? I personally think that it's pushed by the planning system itself. It's overcomplicated. Yeah. Objectors dominate it. And a lot of the work that I do with Just Build Homes is to help people who are directly affected by the housing crisis have a voice in the overcomplicated planning system. Because when you have supporters of house building who are vocal and having their voices heard, it's easier for decision makers to make, merit, to make a decision about the merits of the scheme rather than the politics. Millie, I, I completely agree with you about that. It is a massively overcomplicated system. And thank you so much for all the work you are doing to raise this, because it is an absolute disgrace that we're not building more houses in this country. And I want to see... Look, I'm a Tory MP. I want to see radicalism from all parties about building homes for young people, including my own, and it's interesting to hear what the Labour Party's had today. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Stella, um... Is this going to shift the dial? Yes, and I will tell you why. Because okay. what they are actually going to do is they're going to create a new classification, a grey field, which is going to go beyond what brown fields are right now. Because what you have right now is you need special circumstances for parts of the green belt to be classified as brownfield. So they're going to expand them. We don't yet know what the definition exactly is going to be, but it is going to include areas which in 2011, when the Act came into action, were not actually considered brownfields and they were not falling under the special circumstances. So basically, but what the Labour power, is so doing... So power already exists. That's my point. Is it, you can come up with this new title. It's a really good title. Well and done. Expand, Labor, and Labour Labour Central Office, actually really good, really snappy, does what it says on the tin. But actually, this law already exists. And particularly the brownfield no. first law is already... It's the law of the land. Funnily enough... That was introduced the by problem, the last Labour government. But the problem that you've had with the law so far is because, exactly because you required very special circumstances, you had all of these local councils and the Stella, local no, residents I, coming together sorry, and saying, well, that's well, the point. Sorry, sorry, circumstances that have not been point. satisfied. It isn't... So what Labour is going to do is going to say, no more excuses. Well, OK, but the point is that it isn't the law that it is wrong. I, I, a lot. I asked our, our guest, I the said, who, who do weak. you blame, Millie? Who do you blame? Weak. The government or local councils? It's actually that local authorities are failing to grant permissions when they should, Matthew. And that's difficult for the Labour Party because, because of the brilliant performance of the Conservative Party in recent <laughs> elections, I think you now have the majority of local councils, so surely we should be laying yeah. the door, let blame at Labour's door already. Um, uh, I'm getting the full Stella there. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm going to get the kicking the figures too. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, I think there are two, two issues here, one of which is that even if you do get to build on these land, even if you get planning permission, there's been a huge slowdown in housing associations who provide most public housing because the commitment is that half of this has to be for low-income uh, housing. Uh, at the moment, housing associations uh, are finding it too expensive to borrow because of interest rates, uh, and basically that's grinding to a halt. It's, you know, housing finance is not the sexiest of subjects. It's easy to talk about. We'll let people build on this, that or the other, but you can't if you're doing the second one, of which is if Labour ends up with lots of MPs and leafy constituencies after the next election, they're, they're going to be as mi big as NIMBYs as anybody else because their constituencies are going to put pressure on them. OK, doesn't matter who you vote for, apparently the NIMBYs always win. Coming up in the next hour... We'll be talking about the Middle East tensions and an extreme weather warning, warning us all that we're about to get wet feet, I think. I'm Jake Berry, and you're watching and listening to Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. It's that time again. 
to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon, I'm Jake Berry, Conservative Member of Parliament and former Conservative Party Chairman. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, escalation in the Middle East as the US officials have told American media that an Israel missile struck Iran earlier this morning. Iranian authorities say they intercepted at least three drones. The Israeli military has refused to comment. Sir Keir Starmer has demanded a police investigation into former Conservative MP Mark Menzies. The Member of Parliament for Fylde in Lancashire has had the Conservative whip suspended over claims he misused campaign funds. And Britain isn't properly prepared for future floods, storms or heatwaves. A parliamentary report says that the government is too focused on a short-term response. It isn't planning or investing in long-term plans. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text in on 87222 or tweet us on X at Talk TV. But first, let's get the news headlines with Miranda Shulka. Good afternoon. Iran says it has no plans for immediate retaliation after Israel launched overnight airstrikes near the Iranian city of Isfahan. Iran's state media says three drones were shot down. Iran's Tasnim news agency has posted these pictures of Isfahan's nuclear facility, saying the city is safe and sound. Rishi Sunak refused to speculate until the facts become clear. We have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has warned against the over-medicalisation of everyday stresses and worries as he laid out plans to tackle the UK's benefits bill. 850,000 more people are out of work since the pandemic. Rishi Sunak says he wants to take the responsibility for sick notes out of doctors' hands. Children as young as five are spending time often unsupervised on social media. Regulator Ofcom says 38% of kids now use platforms including TikTok, WhatsApp and Instagram. It's thought nearly a quarter of UK five to seven year olds now have their own smartphone. And here's something that may cheer you up. This is a six week old baby rhinoceros enjoying his first steps in the outside world. 
He now weighs 100 kilos and seems happy enough running around his paddock for the first time at Whipsnade Zoo. Well, you're up to date with the headlines. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we're likely to see some drier, brighter conditions over the weekend at long last. Uh, but it's a bit of a showery end to the week. We've got uh, rain spreading its way southwards. It's going to leave quite a few showers through central areas and down towards the southeast. But those skies clearing from the north, not terribly warm temperatures, 13 or 14 at best in the sunnier west. But eastern coast, pretty chilly values in single figures. And to go with that, a brisk northerly wind. And then as we go through this evening and overnight, those clear skies are going to allow our temperatures to tumble. So the risk of a grass frost for many and one or two pockets of air frost as well. Only those eastern areas where we will see more in the way of cloud and we've got more of a breeze going on are likely to remain frost free. But thereafter, we're looking at a sunny morning, a bright start to Saturday, and we'll see some uh, fine weather throughout the day. We maintain this rather brisk northerly wind that's going to push some cloud over those north sea coasts, and some of that will make its way inland, spreading its way westwards. So we're looking at sunny spells and also times of cloud. Western areas seeing the best of the weather, but temperatures still on the low side, just making double figures for most. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon and welcome back and happy Friday everyone. I've forgotten to say that so far. We had to get to the last hour for me to remember to wish you all happy Friday. I'm Jake Berry and you're watching and listening to Talk TV. Today we're asking you, after more headlines, I can't really believe how this is going actually, 1818 serving members of parliament are currently suspended from their political party because of MPs behaving badly. There's almost a TV sitcom in there. 18 of them. So we're asking you, what do we do about it? How do we clean up politics? So how do we ensure that MPs, men and women, there's both suspended from the party whip, start to behave themselves? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Tweet us on 8722 or tweet us on X at Talk TV. Still with me to go through all of today's biggest stories are former Labour advisors, there's two of them, <laughs> Stella Chandakidu and Matthew Lazar. I mean, you really are the Labour A-team, but I'm oh. going to have words. I don't think this Labour sort of ganging up on me as the, as the only, you blue, need it, Jake. only blue in the corner should be allowed. Um, Matthew, Tell us a little bit. Rishi Sunak did a press conference yeah. earlier and he's been, he's been talking about Rwanda. Yeah, he's been answering questions uh, to, uh, this morning after he gave his speech uh, about welfare. And although he's been criticising the BMA for being hostile on his welfare uh, reforms, what he really most interesting thing he said is about Rwanda. And so he said on Rwanda, the very simple thing is that repeatedly everyone's tried to block us. Yet again, you saw it this week. Um, uh, and so he's gone uh, uh, on to say, our intention now is to get this done. No more prevarication, no more delay. We're going to get this done on so Monday and we will sit there and vote until it's done. So you're going to have a late so night Matthew, on Monday. Matthew, well, it's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly, I, I, I was happy to sit there all through Easter. I, the only day As was I the Labour Party offered to do it. The only day I would have insisted off is Easter Sunday. But uh, the rest of the time, I would have been happy to sit there. But Matthew, <clears throat> tell me, who is prevaricating and delaying? What, what's this delay coming Well, from? actually, I mean, it's Rishi Sunak because the, Lord, the, Lord, the Lords are doing their job. They're there as a revising chamber. Obviously, the Commons as the elected chamber can bat it down. And this thing called ping pong. My dad was a ping pong player, so I, uh, uh, a professional ping pong player. Anyway, there's a random Brilliant. fact about me. Brilliant. So but it's literally called that because it ping pongs from one end of the, of the Palace of Westminster to the other. And often it, as it takes place on the same day. The Lord says one thing, goes back to the Commons, backwards and back and forth, back and forth. And instead, the government hasn't been doing that. It's been delaying it coming back to the Commons, and I reckon it's because they haven't got any planes to take no. people to Okay, Rwanda. well, it's, it's just it's going to run and run, I think, Stella. Uh, Ping Pong, are you a Wif Waf fan? You know what's the problem here, Jake? That this Sunak thinks that there are voters that are actually invested into this. And let me tell you, newsflash, the people don't really care. They really couldn't care less whether this, this, this legislation passes through or not. They care about the asylum secure situation being yeah. dealt with competently, effectively, both in terms of costs and in terms of sustainability and in terms of doing something that doesn't make us Stella, the ridicule you of the pick international up an important community. Point because I'm sure the uh, sustainability is, is right. I'm sure <laughs> the word on everyone's lips, the big question 
is, is the government going to offset the carbon for those <laughs> no, flights? No, that's not to what I'm saying. Stella, she's right, uh, it's a big question. Uh, uh, she's going to get his credit card out and do the carbon offset. That's going to... That's Tall co- individual. We that's can't. going to solve the problem long term. We are going term, to plant to be an strapped. olive tree in Greece to make a difference for all those flights to run. Sorry, I don't know. Sorry for speaking. Again. Olive trees all over us. Right, joining me now is Billy Kemba, who has had an extra. I mean, this is an absolute cork of this story. And congratulations to you, Billy, for the scoop of all scoops into the behaviour of a member of parliament called Mark Menzies. I mean, it's just a brilliant. I actually went out because I read this online. I actually went out and bought the Times yesterday just so I could read this, hold it in my hands in hard copy. You're a senior investigative reporter at The Times. Tell us a little bit about this story and maybe how you got hold of it, if you can. Good afternoon. Yeah, so this is a story that I was working on for really four months uh, coming to uh, to fruition this week. Uh, I learned of uh, details of this extraordinary late night phone call uh, that's at the heart of this in December, not very long after the call had happened. Uh, and then have worked since then to to build up the evidence and and to get to the point where we where we could publish. Okay, well, just just focusing on the story. So effectively, the core of the uh, allegations that you uh, aired exclusively in the Times yesterday was that Mark Menzies, a Conservative member of Parliament for Fylde, is alleged to have misappropriated Conservative Party funds, money given by donors to help him campaign to win his seats for all sorts of personal usages. Tell us a little bit about that. Of course, Mark denies any wrongdoing. Yeah, so the central allegations really are that money that donors in his local constituency have given, as you say, for for campaigning and for election expenses, have instead been used uh, by Mark for his personal expenses, that we believe them to be medical expenses, uh, medical bills that he used the money for. That's about £14,000. And then there was this extraordinary incident in December where he he rang an elderly woman, his his former campaign manager, uh, and told her he'd fallen in with bad people, that he was in a flat in London, uh, and these people weren't letting him leave unless uh, he he met a demand for £5,000 pounds he wanted that money to come from that same campaign fund she refused to do it uh, but in the end uh, another uh, another local tory a staff member of marks his uh, his office manager cashed in her own isa to to provide the money and she was then reimbursed from the campaign fund wow ultimately i think six and a half grand let's look at a couple of the other allegations which um you know as a nation of dog lovers people might be find more interesting than that extraordinary one you've just uh, unearthed is uh, tell us a little bit about the him being questioned by the police about getting a dog drunk yeah so uh, this MP has a, a, a something of a checkered past really as you say in 2017 he was questioned by the police and these bizarre allegations that that he deliberately got a friend's dog uh, drunk by by feeding the dog alcohol it, it should be said that uh, at the time, he, uh, he he said that those allegations were false, and, and the police cleared him. Uh, but but as you say, you know, an extraordinary thing to be accused of. And then, of course, in in twenty fourteen, before that, uh, his his promising career as a, as a ministerial aide and sent up the ladder in in Westminster uh, was curtailed by a story in the Sunday Mirror, where a Brazilian male escort described how uh, how Mark had paid him for sex, had had taken drugs, and and had asked him to procure drugs. And obviously you will have spoken to people on the ground in Fylde. I, Mark, I, I know, is quite well supported by his lo- local association. I think they are very fond of him. He's represented them for 14 years. How are people locally reacting to this story, either as a member of the Conservative Party or just generally? What are people saying about him as their local MP? I think, I mean, I think there's an overwhelming feeling that, that he's got to resign, that this is you know, clearly an inappropriate... Um, behaviour for an MP, uh, and they feel that you know the writing is on the wall. Obviously, the Conservative Party's investigation is is ongoing, and that itself is a sort of topic for a scrutiny this week. Because as we revealed, the Conservatives have known about this since the start of January, when the, the Chief Whip was informed. There's been an investigation ongoing since then. They've spoken to people involved. They've received bank statements and other evidence, uh, and and yet no action was taken for three and a half months. It was only once we published the story. Uh, within within two hours, that, that then the whip was was suspended from from Mr. Menzies, and and he's also been stripped of his role as a government trade envoy. There's there's big questions there for why the party didn't move sooner, and, and whether they were hoping to to sweep this under the carpet and, and hoping it wouldn't see the light of day. So, Billy, let, I mean that that's an extraordinary thing you just said. Let me just focus in on that in a second. So, what you're saying is that you know that the Conservative Party knew about this in December, including the most. In, in January, start of January. In January, sorry, I do beg your pardon. Including the most egregious of these allegations, which have been questioned by 
Annalisa Dodds and Keir Starmer as potentially being criminal, although it, it is denied, and, and took no action. I mean, that's extraordinary. What, 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 have the Conservative Party told you why that is? They haven't. All, of they, all of they've said is a, a statement saying that, you know, they're investigating and that investigations are confidential and, uh, and, and they've indicated they will make a decision on whether to refer the matter to the police once that investigation is, is concluded. But no, they haven't engaged with uh, detailed questions that, that we've sent them a, about the, the timing and the information they've had and, and why they didn't act sooner. Might be a bit late for them to refer it, because I understand that Annalisa Dodds has written to Lancashire Police today asking them to look into these allegations. She has, yes, and the police, I believe, are contacting some of those involved to ask them if they would like to uh, to make a complaint, particularly the donors whose whose money is ultimately at the centre of this and around the allegations of misuse. So I think it's very likely now that the police are going to be opening an investigation before the Conservatives' own investigation has concluded. We don't know when that will be. I mean, you would assume it will now be quicker than it was it was progressing at before, but there's been no indication of any sort of time scale or, or anything like that. Billy, uh, thank you for joining us here on Talk TV and congratulations. It's an extraordinary scoop. And investigative journalists, I'm a survey MP. I hate it when investigative journalists call me, but I know you do an awesome job, so don't call me. I've done nothing wrong. But congratulations on what is an extraordinary story and a fantastic uh, coverage in the, in the Times. For it. Matthew, um, I have to be quite careful. Yeah, of course, uh, Mr Menzies, Mark Menzies, has said uh, he denies these allegations. But in terms of just taking a step back, I mean, this is a proper scandal. This, this isn't. Yeah. This, this is a. This is a bit of a corker, isn't it? A, a, absolutely. I mean, you know, total congratulations to Billy. I think Scoop of the Year awards will be following uh, in due course because it really has got everything, hasn't it? It's got the three a.m. phone call. It's got the catchphrase "bad people," uh, which sounds like something out of uh, a mafia movie, a sort of bad mafia movie. Um, it, you know, the, the, the poor elderly Tory lady, uh, and then the staff member cashing their ISA in to sacrifice it for the MP. I mean, if if, if these are proven correct, um, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I mean, we'll be seeing this as a, as a film, no doubt, in its own right, because it's just... It's, if you put it in a, in a film without it having happened, you wouldn't be believed, because it just seems so uh, extraordinary. But I think the big political point is, why do the Tories know about this for three months the, uh, and do nothing? The 78-year-old um, uh, woman involved who was allegedly rung at uh, three-something in the morning, um, she has said that she spoke personally to the Chief Whip um, uh, and that he... Uh, that Simon Hart, the Tory Chief Whip... Yeah, sorry, just checking you're finished. So, uh, um... Uh, a bit of Billy there. Um, so, uh, the uh, person is the chief whip and he did nothing. So, she said this morning she's hugely disappointed. And this obviously is a woman who spent 40 years running Tory election campaigns. So, I mean, that's not a good look for a party when somebody uh, uh, like that, uh, who's a stalwart of your party, is saying that they're, they're hugely disappointed about how the party's handled this case. But maybe we'll just, we will come on to that because I'm a former party chairman, so I have some pretty strong views on that. I was just flicking through my notes here about what I said when I was chairman about how this sort of behaviour will be dealt with. Stella, um, of course, it isn't just the Conservative Party. There are these 18 members of Parliament from all political parties, some of them Labour, some Conservative, Plaid Cymru, Scottish National Party. It really is across the broad political, um, you know, broad political landscape. Do you think it's acceptable that we have 18 MPs here who've committed various or been accused of various offences, that they sort of sit in Parliament until the end of a parliamentary term and sort of wait their time out when, when you know, when in some ways they're, they're in disgrace. I think that they, I, I think it's unacceptable that they continue to be paid by the taxpayers only if, only if and when it has been proven by the law that they have done whatever it is that they're being accused of doing. I don't think that MPs who are simply under investigation, and that is what will very often happen, the whip will be suspended while they're under investigation. I don't think that, that they should be removed from their positions as, as MPs. Okay, or well, let me, like let me give you an example. Claudia Webb, who mm -hmm. was a Labour MP, has sat independently since 2020. She lost the Labour whip after being charged not just by for harassment. She was convicted of the offence last year and given a 10-week suspended prison sentence in order to carry out 200 hours of community service. That was subsequently reduced, actually, on appeal. But, you know, forget the fact she's a Labour MP, but that, that I think, is probably one of the most egregious uh, ones who still remain in the House of Commons. It can't be right that somebody who's been sus who had a 10-week suspended prison sentence for harassment and very serious allegations yeah. related to it, which we wouldn't want to go into, 
It can't be right that they sort of squat Parliament, just taking their taxpayers' cash until the next election comes along. Of course, it makes you think that there should be a way to remove these people, right? Especially when the accusations are as, 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 as egregious mm. as some of the ones that we have heard. But I do think that there is a danger when it comes to uh, Parliament having the right to remove MPs. It does make you think, is this ever going to be abused? Are we ever going to regret? Well, I think there's a frustration from voters because we've got the recall, uh, the recall um, uh, mechanism uh, where, where you can launch a petition and, and get people back, uh, which is what we saw in Blackpool next to a, a, a file was, that had been started until the MP in question resigned. Um, but the problem is that is only triggered in very limited circumstances. So, so, so Matthew, tell me about this. Like, I really don't know. So this, this case here of Claudia Webb, a former Labour MP, how come that hasn't Triggered a commission. Yeah, to because there were various there were various triggers. One of which is, I think, a minimum prison. Well, no, it's bringing Parliament into dispute. That's actually yeah, it may be ultimately what Boris Johnson was kicked out for for having a a, a, a birthday cake during COVID, which was which he received a, a fixed penalty charge for, together with Rishi Sunak. How you know how can that bring part? Maybe it did bring Parliament into dispute. That's what the committee found. But a ten week suspended prison sentence with the threat of violence and to the threat of an yeah. And Claudia should have resigned. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, but, but she no, should have resigned. There's the, nothing the Labour Party can do. No. To force so I think what no it may be that all parties together uh, need to look at how uh, the recall system works and if the triggers, if the barriers for the triggers are too high, if the prison minimum, uh, you know, if the uh, suspension yeah. from the Commons um, uh, is over a certain length, then you can get a, re a recall petition, uh, but maybe that should be lower. Maybe it should be for uh, all suspensions to give uh, voters the chance. But that's a discussion that needs to happen on a cross-party basis. So it's not seen as being part of political, but, there's also but quite about a keeping big, the House There's also quite a big up. constitutional issue here. There's loads of concern amongst MPs about this. Because, of course, if we had a, any political party elected with a wafer-thin majority, yeah. take Theresa May, 2017, yeah. a majority of whatever it was about, but there's no overall majority, even David Cameron with a small majority. If MPs are systematically removed by the parliamentary authorities, you could actually kick a government out, bad, uh, bad apple by bad apple, I accept yeah. that. I think there's a big constitutional question. I think this is something the next government mm -hmm. will, uh, re will, will revisit. And of course, our big question we've been asking people today as you return to our text messages for the joy of text is what can we do about this? Matthew, are there any text messages Jumping out. I tried to give you as much notice as possible, jumping out. Absolutely. No, no, no. I've got... Um, uh, so I would go uh, for uh, Sean, who says the Nolan principles are supposed to be what MPs abide by. Selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. Precious little of that in Westminster. Those were the principles that were brought in uh, after the, uh, the the scandals at the end of the, um, the major they, government. They don't seem to be working, do they? You've got um, various MPs, who, some of whom we've talked about today, who, in my view... Um, have breached Nolan principles, but they're still sat in Parliament. So maybe this needs tough. Yeah, well, I mean, Dean says, remove all lobbying, stop pay trips uh, for MPs, have them swear faith to this country and its people over all else and have theirs and their family finances open to scrutiny. So that would be, yep. uh, that's Dean's There's approach. There's one way of doing it. Stella, anything that jumps um, Adrian said, call a general election ASAP, and I completely agree, Adrian. This is what's going to show these MPs. They need, we need to get rid of all the bad apples and we need to do it ASAP. The country can no longer wait. Well... There we go. Well, a general election is coming, whether we like it or not. Estella wants it to be tomorrow. I could, um, I, 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 I support the Prime Minister. Let's have it in uh, late autumn. Uh, some of you have been getting in touch about how we try and clear up politics. It's a big question. We love hearing from you on Talk TV about it. Keep those calls coming in on 0344 499 1000. Let's talk to Fred in County Durham. Fred, thank you very much for joining us here live on Talk TV. Yeah, it's New York. To hear from. Listen, um, I've got two or three little points I'd, I'd like to make. The yeah. first one is, looking at the state of the country, I've come to the conclusion that a number of MPs are educated idiots. <laughs> that's OK, that's your said. first point, Fred. Number two? Number two, the, um, le the left wing of the police and the nurses to some degree, all this came about about 30 years ago, or so when they had to have degrees. And where does your left wing come from and your wokeism come from? Your universities in the main. And I believe that's where a lot of problems have stemmed from in, in the modern, modern day. And the steel works in, uh, in, in town closing down are the only steel works that could give us the heavy steel needed for ships, tanks, etc., etc. And they seem to have learned nothing from the last war 
Mm. Where the instrument I think they can just ship over steel, etc. That they need to make the ships and tanks, and nobody, they're, they're all just going to let. Fred, look, I, look I, I find it hard to disagree with anything you're saying. Let's go through it. That you know, nurses and police officers should be able to go through the route of apprenticeship. I think the government has just changed that. That we should be keeping the steelworks open in South Wales. I find it hard to disagree with that. But um, on the issue of the day, issue du jour. How do we stop MPs behaving badly? How? Yeah, well, there's a, there, there, this is what I mean by saying there's educated idiots who haven't got a brain, who haven't got a brain to use. Uh, seemingly, they just don't know right from wrong, and they feel so. Uh, they just feel like they can walk over these things, and they can be buried because of who we are. Do you, you know, do you uh, think politics attracts risk takers to it? Do you think that sort of thing of that's what people sometimes say? I'm not sure I agree with it. That thing of the elections, the the, the razzmatazz of uh, being an MP attracts risk takers. Would you accept that's a, a reasonable thing to say? Not well, to a degree, but what I believe, which was already expressed once on your program earlier on, that the MPs should not be parachuted in. It, the MP should be a local person mm. who, with the experience of local of Fred, what goes on in the locality. Fred, you're absolutely right. Stop this professionalisation of politics. Let's get back to yeah. ordinary people like they and me yeah. getting into Parliament. Fred, thank you very much for calling in to Talk TV. Love hearing from you at home, particularly there from Fred in Durham. Coming up next, we're going to be discussing the escalating conflict between Iran and Israel. I'm Jake Berry, and you're watching Talk TV. See you after this break. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk TV. I'm Jake Berry, and you are watching and listening to us online, hopefully on your smart speaker and even on your telly. Next, we are going to be talking about the escalating conflict between Israel and Iran, something we should all be deeply concerned about after last night there were some strikes on Iranian territory allegedly by the Israeli government. Joining me now is military and defence analyst and analyst, Colonel Simon Diggins. Colonel Diggins, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Israel has not admitted responsibility for these attacks yet uh, on Iran. Uh, do you think they're likely to do so? And are we going to find out more information about what exactly has gone on as the day proceeds? I think we'll probably get less information, Jake, than the Israelis revealed when they were attacked. Israel has a policy of not uh, giving a lot of detail about its attacks. So, for example, when it did attack the, or certainly attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus, it didn't announce that. Uh, and generally speaking, it doesn't announce its attacks into uh, other countries' territories. Uh, the Iranians have put out a certain amount of information, uh, but they've also been very keen to emphasise, in their view, how limited the success of the attack was. But clearly, they're not in a position or willing to explain that the thing had gone very badly. So we may not get a huge amount, much more detail from that, but information may emerge over the next couple of days. But I don't think we're going to get the sort of the full detail we got uh, on the, the response to the Iranian attack on Israel a few nights ago. And is this likely, Colonel Diggins, to be the end of the matter, or do you think we're going to now see, as night follows day, a response from Iran against Israel? Um, it's a really hard question to, to answer. You'll recall immediately prior to the Iranian attack, they'd also taken hostage effectively a, uh, a vessel. And the question in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf of Oman, and the question there was, was, was that their response? to the attack by Israel, or presumed attack by Israel, onto, onto Damascus. So it's unclear whether this is just the, uh, the precursor, uh, effectively a sort of demonstration to show we could do something, or it could be, it could be something uh, more, uh, as a sort of a, a, just the, 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 the attack in itself, and that's the end on it. I mean, there is a neat point about what they, they did. I mean, the, the main attack appears to be around an air base near As Isfahan uh, in the sort of southwest of the country. Uh, and, of course, a lot of the Iranian targets was around a, an air base in, in the south of, of Israel as well. So there's a certain amount where you could say, we're just showing you we could do what we're going to do, uh, and we could do more if required. So it may be the end of it, uh, but it rather depends on the, on the reactions of the two, uh, two leadership groups. Well, you know, should we be concerned about Iran being a threat in the UK or are they just a threat to Israel and the wider region? No, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the key points that we need to be really honest with ourselves about. Um, Iran has a very wide range of capabilities it's using. Um, it doesn't have a great strength in, on the, what we might call conventional warfare. Um, it's got this rather strange mix of equipment. It's either had left over from pre-1979 or it's acquired since then. What it has done, and we've seen it in, uh, in the Middle East through its proxies, but also through the operations of the IRGC, um, it's got a, sort of a, a, a very thorough game uh, ability to conduct what you might call grey zone warfare, whether it be hybrid through proxies, through propaganda outlets, uh, and, and through various organisations who will propagate uh, their message. So, yes, they are a threat to us. Um, and I think we need to be much more conscious of it than we have been so far in the past. Well, if, if, they, if they do remain such a threat to the United Kingdom, why do you think Rishi Sunak has... Uh resisted calls to ban the Iranian Revolutionary Guard or the IRGC, as they know? Yeah, no, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a $64,000 question, Jake. It's a good one to ask. I think there's two reasons. The first is the extent to which the IRGC is sort of completely and thoroughly infiltrated into what you might call the Iranian state apparatus. Iran is a strange country. You've got a lot of the things that look like a normal, even a functioning democracy. There's a parliament, there's leadership, everything goes with it. And then you've got this parallel state, at the head of which is the, is the, is the religious leadership of the, of the country, and then the IRGC, who are dedicated to supporting the revolution. But the IRGC is now thoroughly integrated into a lot of the state. So one of the concerns would be that if we actually say we're going to prescribe this organisation and not talk to it, then those bits of the Iranian state who we need to talk to, we will no longer be able so, so to do. I mean, that's the, that's the first side for it. And linked to that, it's the professional advice that Nushi Sunak it appears to be getting from both the Foreign Office, the FCDO, and also from our security agencies, who both say that they do not need 
for the IRGC to be prescribed to do what they need to do. So I think that's the, that's where he is at the, at the moment. Other people are taking a different view, but I think if you ask the question, why is he not prescribed them, as other people are saying do, I think that's the reason why. But wouldn't prescribing them send a message, and you're right, that we are out of step with many of our allies on this, aren't we? No, I, I think we are. And I, I think it's very, you know, it would be a perfectly reasonable thing to say and to do and just say, you know, up with this, we will not put. Uh, we've had enough of the fact that you'll be the radicalisation uh, of, of Islamic student groups within, within this country, uh, the propagation of, 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 you know, frankly, hate speech uh, in this country, and they're responsible for it. And then, then Iran will have to adjust in terms of if they have to move people away from it, that, that, that's fine. I would have no difficulty with, with, uh, with them, them being prescribed. Uh, I don't think it adds anything to them. As you say, many of their, our allies have already prescribed them. Uh, and frankly, we can do without uh, people who are, who are propagating hate speech in our country. Colonel Dickens, it's been fascinating to hear from you, particularly about the real impact of this in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for joining us here on Talk TV. Still with me is Stella Chandikidu and Matthew Lazza, the brace of Labour advisers who've been sent here this week to give me a bit of a... Isn't that uh, like pheasants? Are we going to be shot down? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they're sent here to give me a, a tough time. Uh, look, really interesting conversation there. I, I mean, I, I actually think the real sort of gem out of that interview with Colonel Diggins, Stella, was the fact that the, this influence of the IRGC, the Iranian, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, here in the UK, not something I think people are widely aware of, is it? No, they're not widely aware of that. And it is, it is something that is quite difficult for the British public to grasp because you have all of these very different groups and you have all of these different ideologies. And obviously what you don't know about sounds scarier and more terrifying that, than it actually is. But at the same time, you're not really sure what kind of policy to support when you don't have full knowledge. But it all feels just like such a long way away, doesn't it? You know, it's happening thousands of miles away, almost you know, while we're interested in it, it feels very remote. But, Matthew, have, have you heard about this radicalisation that the IRGC, IRGC uh, is not... apparently doing? On university campus. Yeah, no, no, not to that extent. I mean, we, we know that they have a, a hand. We've seen the um, uh, the attack on the uh, Iranian TV journalist uh, over the last few weeks, which questions still, significant questions still re remain about. I think it's such a difficult uh, issue because, as Ken Rodriguez was saying, if you, if you, it, you know, it's, it, in a sense, it, we feel like we should stop talking to the, uh, to the Revolutionary Guard because we should prescribe them as an organisation. But if mm. that effectively means you're not talking to the Iranian state and there are things we need to talk to the Iranian state about, not at least to put pressure on them uh, over various issues, issues, then that could be a self-defeating measure. So I think it's so complicated, not just actually for the public, which is it, it, it is, but also for politicians to realise what do we, we need to be seen to be doing something, but could that do more harm than good? And America's taken a, a bit of a hard line on this. Do you think following those American elections, if we see the re-election of Biden or the re-election of Trump, do you think there'll be a big change in policy in regards to both Iran and Israel? Well, I think that Trump certainly would. I mean, Trump is, uh, you know, the cowboys and Indians, uh, Western-style politics, as people used to say, uh, 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 you know, you need an enemy, uh, and he certainly will re regard enemy, uh, Iran as his sort of number one uh, enemy, and he'll be very keen to uh, be seen to be supporting Israel. But whether he does that practically support allies is another question. Remember, he is still holding up. Tomorrow in the Congress, we'll see the bill which includes support for Israel and Taiwan, as well as uh, the uh, stalled money for Ukraine, going before the Congress. And let's, uh, he's still trying to encourage representatives and senators to vote against it. Well, really interesting. I think we're going to have to hold our breath a bit for that American elections. Let me take you back, because Stella was saying in the break that she spotted so many brilliant texts from you at home that she, 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 she persuaded me. My arm was stretched up my back during the last break to return back to the joy of text. Stella, come on, something has really jumped out of you here. And it's oh. quite funny, so we've got to, got to make time for it. Oh, yes, Jake. Steve, a total legend, has texted to say... MPs must live in the constituency they represent. For those who live outside London, free overnight accommodation will be provided on the BB Stockholm. Stop the freebie culture of tickets to sporting events, con concerts and second jobs. Place a limit on the expenses an MP can claim. Modernise working practices in Parliament. Why do people get honours for doing their job? Ah, well, there we go. There's maybe some... Sir, Sir, Sir Jake Berry uh, nods his head there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got a feeling that might have been slightly tilted towards me. You might have a bit of a bob, come on. 
that's the only thing that... Yeah, um, uh, uh, Aaron says, I, I'd start by removing all the activists from politics. I'd make lobbying illegal, political campaigns public funded only. Uh, that, that I think is going to come back, actually, if we have a, you know, the issue of public funding for politics. Uh, the public would get a say in what politicians get funding for and how much funding they receive uh, uh, and get rid of um, uh, all other uh, sources uh, of money. And the John's all, got a funny... But all the polling we have in this country says that the public hates the idea of paying taxpayers' cash to pay politicians to campaign. OK, they, they hate the idea of paying them to paying politicians to do their job, let alone for them to campaign. So you think that it's likely that this will come back if, you know, after the general Well, election? one thing that's happened, which almost nobody noticed, do you remember when the uh, Tories said that you don't have to just be... A, uh, uh, voters have left the country for five years, we've always been able to vote, the Tories have now extended that back to being forever, so you can leave the country, not pay taxes here and still vote here forever. But so that was got the media attention. Underneath that is the Tories have almost doubled the amount that can be spent in the general election campaign, up to 30-something million, and we just don't have the culture of political donation. So I think... What do I do? Because I think Labour's already raised that much, haven't they? No, no, but, it, 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 it's, it's, well, it's on well. target to it's do on, so. Well, it, it's on target to do so. so. So if it's such an impossible task, well, how come the Labour... But, but, but then but the it? public don't like p uh, paying for politics, but they also don't like it when they see rich people or the trade unions um, controlling politics uh, uh, either through donations as they see it. So the public's quite conflicted on that. Here's just a funny one from John. First, I would help Thames Water solve their sewage discharge problem by pumping it all into the Houses of Parliament. There we go. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Thames Water... You know my view about Thames Water? Let it go bust. Uh, I know it's got lots of money invested in it, but some investments work and some investments don't. Um, Gary, I'm just going to pick up one last text because uh, he might get his way. Gary says, just sap the lot of them and start again. Well, Gary... He's got that power. A lot of them will be. Exactly. The power that we have in Parliament, it doesn't belong but... to us, it belongs to you. And at every election, MPs have to go and give it back to their constituents. They have I done a good enough job to uh, wield that power on your behalf for the next four or five I years. can't get the idea of all, all the so MPs general in the election, stock home. Every MP gets sacked at a general election. They have to reapply for the job. So, Gary, you are, I think, in autumn this year, if the Prime Minister is right, and it ultimately is him who has the power to call him gentleman, you are going to get your wish. Look, and on the Bibby stock yeah. and barge, I mean, you know, it's got to be used for something, hasn't it? Exactly, because there's no asylum seekers on it. Then... In Sweden, um, MPs have to basically stay in effectively like halls of residence, uh, uh, student style. But I wonder if that would actually be encouraging them to get up to more no good with each other. Can you imagine Deco Brief Smog? Well, the thing is, the, one thing the baby Stockholm barge did have was dentists. And a GP <laughs> surgery. It might be perfectly, perfectly set up for members of parliament. And if, could, and if we ever, ever got really fed up, we just cut the chains and float it down river. <laughs> Send them off send into, it to the, France. Into, 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 into the English <laughs> Channel and you know, let the French deal with us. Oh. This, this, this idea has merit. This is why we love hearing Absolutely. from you at home because, one, it really amuses us when you come up with brilliant ideas like this, but every single one, there is a grain... Could they be, should they be tagged? ...grain of truth <laughs> and merit and genius in all of your comment. And that's why we're so pleased now to be going to one of our callers because people are still getting in touch on 03444991000. Keep those calls coming in. Let's hear from Daniel in Epsom, who doesn't understand, he joins me in this, why people want to vote <laughs> Labour. Daniel, thank you for calling into the show. Do you, do you know what? Oh, hi, Jake. Do, do you know what? The thing is, the, the, the government, the Conservative government have been weak and socialist and they haven't done anything. They've been inactive and they've not been a very good government. But... And they've also lied to us. Remember, immigration is ruining this country. They said they'd get illegal, they'd stop illegal immigration and they'd get legal immigration down to tens of thousands and they've lied to us and they haven't done it. But for anyone out there that's thinking that a Labour... Well, why, would anyone think that vote, why would anyone think that voting Labour is going to solve any of our problems? It's going to make everything worse. And I'll tell you why. Because what's good, you're going to get more mass immigration. They're going to drag us back to the EU kicking and screaming. You're going to get more woke agenda. You're going to get more green agenda, more ULEZ, more green restrictions. It's going to get worse. Daniel, who are you going to vote for then? I'm going to vote reform, but if you look at... I'll give you an example. Look at everything that Labour runs. It turns to you-know-what. London's a toilet. Wales is mismanaged. You've got... Birmingham City Council, oh, they're all broke. Why would you vote for Labour when everything they run is abysmal? Mm. Well, uh, well, I'd like, it's hard to disagree with you, Daniel, but I'll just say, do you think reform have got the right ideas to change the country for the better? Uh, I, I, think, I think what they'll do is they'll make the actual Conservative Party take a step back and, and actually get rid of half of them that are weak, centrist and socialists and come back as a force and come back as an actual right of centre conservative party because when you've got 
the two options in the way our political system works is broken. And the majority of people in this country are... We, we've given the, the current government explicit instructions to do many things, and they've not done it. And Labour will only make things worse. We have to have a right-of-centre government that we voted for. And if Daniel, you can't do thank it, you. Get it's time. I, I, I get what you're saying. You don't like these chinos, as Liz Trust calls them, the Conservatives in name only. Thank you very much for calling into the show. Really interesting to hear from a reform voter there. Stella, do you, do you agree with them? So I have a lot of sympathy for what this caller was saying because I do understand when you are looking at the political party system and you're saying it's broken and you have no trust that anyone is going to do anything different. I have a lot of, I have a lot of sympathy for that. But I do think... I want to say it's unfair when Labour has not been in power for 15 years to say everything they run doesn't work and, like... They're, they're well, he, not he gave some examples. He said he was unhappy with London. Daniel said he, Wales was falling behind. He gave some Birmingham City Council has gone bankrupt. He did give some examples. Well, we can I name think... Tory councils that have gone bankrupt as well. Thorough. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, loads of... And loads more councils are coming... are going to be bankrupt in the next year. It really is not something that has to do with the political... just with the political party. So I'm sure there, there is... But is that the problem, though, Stella? On because actually... Oh, there's two points to think about here. So, first of all, even if we have a Labour government, there is no magic wand. If there was a magic wand in British politics, Rishi Sunak would be waving it frantically now, would he be fixing all the ills? If Labour come into power, and if you believe the opinion polls, that's likely, you know, the fundamental fact is we're an ageing population. We've spent £400 billion on COVID. There's a, there are wars and energy crisis around the world. Labour isn't coming up with something really radical to change this. They're just sort of saying, well, we'll change the management and things will get better. I, I just don't accept they will, actually. Yeah, and I, I understand that. I understand that. I honestly do. But at the same time, you cannot blame, blame the Labour Party when you're looking at... But you can't really... You're, you're if looking if at you're the being campaigns... honest, I know, I know you're a former Labour advisor, but if you're being honest, you can't really blame the government for COVID. You can't really blame the government for Ukraine. You can blame them you can't for austerity really blame them and mismanagement. Grave mismanagement. Well, you can, maybe so. You can... I, think the problem, I think the problem for Labour is, obviously, things can only get better was the famous uh, uh, mm. song and slogan and feeling in 1997. I think the problem is the Labour government's going to get elected on a feeling that things can't get any worse or, you know, that you can't do a worse problem. job. So, I mean, I think that is a, a, the issue of, like, whether it's going to be a sort of a government starting in hope or starting in despair uh, with a sort of national national mood it is a big question. And as George Galloway once famously said, if voting in elections made a difference, you wouldn't be allowed to do it. Coming up, we're going to be talking about an extreme weather warning from a parliamentary committee. This is Talk TV. I'll see you straight after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> just 
Yeah. 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, to put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. And we want to hear from you today on 0344 499 1000. You can get in touch on any issue, but particularly how do we clean up politics after another MP has lost the whip in Parliament for alleged bad behaviour. We also learned today from a parliamentary committee uh, that the government is not focused enough on the long-term effects of extreme weather and climate change. Joining me now to discuss this is Jim Dell, author of two books, Whether or Not and How to Prepare for Extreme Weather, to, to talk about the personal and commercial impacts of weather and climate. Jim, I was getting your plug in there. Yeah, I you always, were. You almost were. didn't you, you read the rest of it. So it's tell us your, your latest book, 25th of April, um, How yeah. to Survive Extreme. It's the, a survivor's guide to the extreme weather we're seeing, isn't it? So this is the book. Yeah. And you can pre-order it, but it's 25th of April it comes out. It's been co-authored. Co so this is uh, co-authored with Michael Hawke, who's a survivalist, a bit like Bear Grylls in the United States. So it's a US book. Uh, but it, it's uh, it's there to it's there for not just for climate reasons. Make this absolutely clear. Okay. This is for any type of extreme. Right, well, that you we've might got find we've got the plug in. in. So if you're in Dubai at the moment, where we've seen extraordinary. Oh, well, I'm glad you mentioned it. Of yeah. flooding, uh, you you'd want that book in your hand luggage. There you we go. Right, plug, plug dealt with. Let's talk Thank about you. the public accounts committee. Yeah, who have been quite critical of the government, really saying, particularly after the COVID pandemic, it's moved from long-term flood planning to a much more short-term approach. What do you think they mean by that? I, I, I think this is a long time coming, and I don't think it's just happened yesterday. There's been sort of um, whispers and uh, stuff going on for some time in terms of the government not moving fast enough. And to be frank with you, in the in the job that I do, I can quite see it, obviously. And um, you've mentioned Dubai, so let's, let's just focus on that. That is a major, major city, a modern city that basically fell apart in, in a 24-hour period with an uh, incessant amount of rain. Um, that didn't just happen because it was a normal event, and it did not happen because of cloud seeding. Make that absolutely yeah. clear. Uh, that is not the case. Um, this happened because of uh, an event, a low-pressure event, intense thunderstorms, two air masses meeting, uh, intense thunderstorms, slow moving, so it put down a year to a year and a half rain across that area and beyond, by the way, into Oman and other places where people lost their lives. Um, it just shows our modern city, like Dubai, and if anybody's ever been to Dubai, you'll understand how modern it is in terms of their infrastructure, etc. Could not cope. How, how their lifestyle get... almost hangs by it by a thread and can be broken by these extreme weather events. Yeah. Moving closer to home, though, uh, we've had I think the wettest winter on record. But I also see that this year is an El Nino year yeah. around the world. Do you think those two things are linked, or is this weather? these more extreme weather events, part of the wider climate change that we're seeing across You have the to put the two together. El Nino is a part of the equation. It's, it's, it's no, no use uh, climatologists or meteorologists saying that's not part of the equation. But we do, when, when it is an El Nino year, just for our viewers at home, you, we do get more of these wetter, warmer you, weather you, events. You get uh, extended droughts, you get extended floods, depending on where they are. But I think we've got to go back more than one year. El Nino has been running for about a year and a bit, and in fact, it's just died. Uh, so... There we go. That one's that one's uh, no more, and um, we'll wait for the La Nina next to, to come up, which has got its own mm. its own flavours in terms of more hurricanes, etc. But yeah, it does add to the pile. But 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 this is the point: climate change per se, in terms of a storm, that storm would have happened anyway. It's just exacerbated by climate change because of the energy that's transferred into the ocean and the atmosphere, mm. which is why heat is the big 
is the big uh, uh, elephant in the room as far as as far as what climate does and, that, and how it operates. I, I do think these criticisms of the government by Meg Hillier and the Public Accounts Committee that you know the government is thinking very short term and should be thinking in a multi decadal way. Uh, I believe well, the report says. I, do, you know that's all that's all well and good, and of course no one's going to disagree with that. But of course. All of these changes are going to be paid for by taxpayers. Governments really only look in four or five year time horizons because we're a democracy. So we, if we were somewhere like Dubai or China, it would be much easier because yeah. just, you know, they, they don't have the same democratic accountability. How do we how do we get politicians to start talking about this in a you, longer you've term? You've got way? to look at um, you've got to look at the costs involved because you just mentioned the co you know costs going forward and this is this you know we've got to put a lot of money into to prevent this and we're only a small place and what about China we hear all these arguments you've got to do, you know you, you you've got to there's got to be a little bit of um, what you might call self interest in terms of that side of things do your best individually and then collectively, and I think that's what anybody would do in any walk of life. So I think that this committee's correct in terms of highlighting this. We're not moving fast enough. We need to move faster. And the costs on the other side of the incidents, which is where I'm going with this, are going to far outweigh the costs of the, the preparedness and the mitigation. But is uh, it, look, and finally, and then I'm going to bring our panel in, but is it possible, because I often hear this debate where people say, look, you just cannot use engineering to get yourself out of climate change. No, you cannot. I mean, I... I so I, what do we do it's, first I mean, it's, all, look, it's a bold statement. I, I, what can yeah, we do? Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pieces. Uh, <laughs> you, you can do. And, and, the, and the, the reason for that is that within this, there's a lot of what you might call common sense. Mm. Common sense stuff. In other words, you see cars going down a flooded road and suddenly they're floating away whether they be Ferraris or Rolls Royces in Dubai or not. The point is, is that a lot of this is, is, is education, common sense, what do you do? And by the way, that doesn't cost a lot. That really does not cost a lot. So you can get that into schools, colleges, universities, teach them how to not just mitigate, but to, uh, how they actually operate within a, a climate affected So place. sort of civilian preparedness and yeah. society. Stella, do you, do, you, do you feel that um, you have the right information from the government about being prepared for extreme weather and climate events? No, I really don't. And I, I say that because I grew up in Greece in an area where we had a lot of earthquakes when I was growing up and we continue to do so. And so in school, we were always taught how to react uh, to, to an earthquake. I don't feel like for extreme weather conditions, we, ha we have had similar education. And I, 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 I'm not aware of exactly what's going on at schools, but I don't think the general public does. Especially... I think there was extreme flooding in Athens, wasn't there? Uh, late yes, last year? yes, yes. And there is extreme flooding, in, and not just in Athens. There you, you, also, other you also had the wildfires. Wild wildfires, yeah, the yeah, wildfires exactly. that we have every single, the every single year, and every single year it continues being a problem, and you continue having, you know, uh, people. Who, who are in rural areas being really, really scared because Greece is not the country that has the infrastructure to deal with this. And I don't think that the UK is much, much better in a lot of these issues. Well, I think what's really important, as Jim says, is about common sense. I think what we shouldn't do is let prepare is let the kind of you know culture war about climate change get in the way of, of sensible preparedness, so that we can all know what, what to do because extreme weather is happening, whatever you think the cause is, and we need to be prepared. So let's not let you know um, uh, the getting rid of net zero or going for net zero get in the way of teaching people how to react when things happen and impact them. And do you think, Matthew, this is something we can start to incorporate into the curriculum in schools? Yeah, I mean, it seems to me they're absolutely and, and sensible things that we can do. Maybe that's actually a more sensible thing to do in schools uh, than some of the sort of climate campaigning. Rather than getting school children to do posters mm -hmm. about, you know, about, uh, you know, to, to back Greta, maybe it's better to think about what they can do in their community when they get hit by extreme weather. Yeah, I mean, there's a thing called passive greening, which is which sounds like not a lot. Um, I go into studios and what have you and look around sometimes in, in, in the green rooms and places like that and it's always like plastic plants, this, that, the other, thinking, OK, look, you can mitigate uh, temperature, for example. I go running in a woods next to me or walking in the woods uh, and on a hot day like we had in 2022, 40 degrees, it's 10 degrees cooler in those, mm. in those, in those woods. Yeah. Very, very simple things mm. can, can alleviate some of the problems. So, for example, in south, southern Spain and maybe in Greece as well, uh, Houses painted white, yeah, okay, yeah, to offset yeah, yeah. the heat. Wouldn't take a lot to paint some of these roofs in London, for example, where we're standing here, uh, to uh, to mitigate some of that. By law, the islands, away. by law, the on the islands, they have to be uh, painted white. Yeah, a, a and traditional again, lime washer thing, and, and actually, not, cost a you know, not not a big thing to do. Um, let me just correct myself, by the way. I was told by my left panel, in fact, I miss attributed my quote 
to George Galloway when in fact it was Ken Livingston. Sorry, Ken. We've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Up next is Caleb and O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips with Crosstalk. I'm Jake Berry, and I'll see you at the same time next week. Thank you so much for joining me here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth.